listening to episode 269 of Mito Life Radio. I'm Matt Blackburn, your host, and today I'm excited to have back Adam Bergstrom. I think this is our 17th show that we've done together. And in this one, we focus on something called anthropomaximology, which is essentially the study or the science of human potential. I break it down with him into three categories. So we start with the physical aspect of what humans are capable of doing, like superhuman feats of strength. He talks about a person that was shot point blank in the middle of the head and survived. He shares the story of someone being buried alive for 40 days and how they did it. I ask him about being underwater for prolonged periods of time. And he shares the story about Master Wu Dang Chen. And then he talks about Mr. Eats It All that ate razor blades, shopping carts, a coffin. And then we talk about the mental and emotional parts of human potential. And a listener asks, what is the best way to heal from trauma? Another listener asks for a self hypnotizing technique for healing curses or trauma and adam shares his thoughts on that i ask adam if lucid dreaming or dreaming in general can help with our mental development and then lastly we talk about the psychic and spiritual aspect of human potential and i kick it off with co2 or carbon dioxide and adam describes what property spiritually is associated with each gas and i ask him some more listener questions including will we end up living in a star wars universe i.e space travel ability to live on other planets etc another listener asked what is your go-to lunch for adam someone else do you wish you had always been a vegetarian and then he goes into color recycling and which colors are associated with different traumas. So enjoy the show. Here is Adam Bergstrom. All right, Adam Bergstrom, welcome back. Greetings and salutations, (laughs) Matt. (laughs) Yeah, this is going to be a fun one talking about anthropomaximology. Did I get that right? That's the one. Yeah. Again, I, I looked it up on the internet. It said anthro maximology is only one reference. And I thought, well, my memory muscle must be malfunctioning because uh, I remembered it as anthropo maximology. And the more I thought about it, wait a minute, they're wrong or they're partly right. And it was maximo, uh, anthropo maximology, basically. What is the most you can get out of a human being supernaturally, physically, emotionally, uh, intellectually? Like there was a guy on Patrick Bet David who could feel the weight of, of uh, playing cards and tell which were the face cards and which were the, the queen and all of that by the weight of the card alone. Those are the kind of wow. things that people – sometimes spend a lifetime developing. Sometimes it's kind of foolish, you know, the the yogis who would stand on one foot for years and have their hands clasped where the nails grew through their flesh out the other side. So their hands were non-functional. I don't know what the purpose is, but it is pretty amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I've seen videos of them uh, or people in, but India sticking like rods through their, what, uh, through their head, like through one ear, not the other, through their tongue. I don't know, crazy stuff. <laughs> crazy stuff. Yeah, the, I, I'm impressed by the people who mastered being buried for as over a month. The record, I think, is 40 days that we know about, and the British validated it because they figured, well, Indians aren't that important. And if this guy is crazy enough to say he can be buried for 40 days, bury the sucker. So they put him underground in a coffin about uh, six foot under, maybe three feet. And they put him in a a vault. And then they had guards guard him 24 hours a day so no one could sneak up and 
pass them some air or some kind of food or water or something. And they dug them up 40 days later, and the British became obsessed with how did he do that? And a colonel actually mastered the technique. But one time, he, he couldn't do it for 40 days, but he could do it for a couple of days. And one day he went to do a demonstration, and he didn't come back. <laughs> so it's a dangerous business. <laughs> <laughs> was that was that the guy that got buried for 40 days that was drinking uh, a lot of donkey milk? Yes. Okay. <laughs> he, he said that you need it, or they claimed the group that was doing this because they were more they were more like David Copperfield getting paid. They would go into town and get paid to do these stunts. So I wouldn't call it spiritual necessarily, <laughs> but it, it was amazing. And they would get paid to be buried. So when the British found out about that, they basically challenged this guy. And they found out it was the carbon dioxide regulation that he was able to control. And he claimed, as others did, that donkey milk was the most you could have was a little rice. Anything else, and you couldn't do it. You wouldn't survive. And and they lived in the dark. How did they get their vitamin D? You know, they drank donkey milk. Maybe the donkey was exposed to the vitamin D. But it's pretty amazing stuff. And I'd heard that story for decades and didn't believe it. You know, I thought they're out of their mind. But then I found these British medical records that are online. You can find it where they uh, went into the uh, I mean, it, it, it created a sensation and the British military became interested then in mesmerism and all kinds of things. Mm. They uh, they eventually closed it down because mesmerism was too great a a competition for the medical profession who didn't like it. There were hundreds of books written about mesmerism that have been now uh, basically hidden where where you don't know about them. That's why when I wrote uh, mesmerism and miracles. I didn't realize it was that extensive that maybe it's thousands of journal articles, including uh, the, the, the AMA wrote about it back in the day when it was first formed in 1848, I think it was formed. So they had a long time to investigate it. And mesmerism was as much known as uh, hypnotism today. And today, basically, Hypnotism is mesmerism's stepchild <laughs> because it. Uh, they say hypnotism may work sometimes, and it's all suggestion. But mesmerism was like energy between people. And look at applied kinesiology. It's a type of mesmerism. I was shown how to do that by, uh, well, I already knew, but I was shown by a Texas highway patrolman how they weaken people before by going down their central meridian. They call it splitting the optical field and weaken a person and also have them give an address because if you say a number over 10, you're weakened. And that gives you extra strength to disarm a person, even so much that you could... Uh, on a person with a weak immune system, they could be weakened for as much as five minutes. Most people recover in 30 seconds to 45 seconds. Gives you an edge when you're disarming a person with a knife or a gun or whatever you're doing. Wow. It, it's funny, Ken, going back to the, the group that got buried alive, you said they lived in the dark. And that stood out to me because I did an April Fool's post uh, yesterday <laughs> where I was saying I was going breatharian and I was going to live off the sun and kind of just poking, poking fun at like the quantum health community, you know, that I, I was in eight years ago and I was, you know, just hook, line and sinker, the ice bass, the naked sunbathing, the grounding. And that was like the top most important thing for health. And I was kind of making, making fun of it a little bit. And uh, when you said these people lived in the dark, it, it's interesting now because when I look on social media, like in the health world, it's just so trendy right now that we're sun worshipers and we absolutely need the sun like every day of the summer and you need to see every sunrise and sunset. But you said these people lived in the dark that did these amazing feats. So it's interesting. In the dark. And, you know, there's something I learned from uh, Swami Nitty Gritty at Donald Lay back in the day. He claimed that there were actually different species of people, including aliens. 
and that we were carbon based, but there were also silicon based, sulfur based, and methane based. And uh, he also said that in our interactions with these people, we actually, they ended up forming our chakras. So our first chakra was basically carbon based, our second one silicon, our third one sulfur, and our fourth one methane. And that uh, these were aliens. Now, when I researched that, there are those beings on Earth, to my amazement, only they come as bacteria. So I wondered if uh, Donald Lay was talking about uh, uh, beans, uh, what would you call it? Uh, basically, not, not for real big beans like people, but as the bacteria that came in. Because there is a theory how they got on the Earth called panspermia, where comets came in with these life forms and methane-based and sulfur-based beans, they really exist, uh, came in with it and they went below the earth and formed these bacteria called archons and different names. This is science. I'm not making this up out of a, out of a uh, uh, metaphysical site or anything. And the, the, there's two types. They usually live in volcanic vents thousands of miles below, well, thousands of feet below the sea. And in these vents, there are sulfur-based bacteria and there are methane-based bacteria. And they're really not even bacteria. They're related to it, called archons, and I think there's another name for the other one. Well, at the time, I asked uh, Adonal Lay, you talk about carbon-based, you talk about silicon-based, you talk about uh, uh, sulfur-based, but when you say methane, that's not a single element. Is there a single element that goes with that? And without hesitation, he said magnesium. So as I researched years later, sure enough, the sulfur-based uh, archons run on iron and, uh, and sulfur, and the methane-based ones run on methane and magnesium, just like he said. So it gives further credence. Plus, the Osage Indians actually said that uh, there were four types of people. And basically, they pretty much corresponded to those four beings. So I can't say that actual aliens came to this planet. But probably, uh, where did those sulfur-based uh, bacteria come from? And the methane-based bacteria. And silica is the hardest one to prove, strangely enough, even though it's the most commonly cited in science fiction movies and uh, novels. But, uh, but there is some evidence that there are these uh, creatures that form the white hills of Dover that actually are mostly silicon. And we have a lot of silica that we use in well the soil our plants grow in pure silica pure, pure glass basically and we have it in our body and it can actually form granules and hard parts in our body and it's been attributed that the hardness of the bone has a lot to do with silica that's interesting so it's beyond because you often hear of people with more melanin can handle more sunlight because melanin transmutes high, the high energy into heat and other wavelengths. Uh, but we're kind of going beyond if you're darker skinned or lighter skinned into these four categories. That's interesting. So maybe people that do better with less sunlight or potentially no sunlight or more, will they be the methane based beings? You know, Gen general <laughs> electric actually uh, did research and discovered that we had basically a fourth autonomic nervous system where our adrenal glands, the adrenal medulla, the little bitty center of the adrenal glands is all in the skin. That's where the major part is. And that we have the ability to shape shift and change color like a chameleon because the, chl the chloroplasts are very much related to the chameleons. So that is still in our skin. And they found out that melanin, though it does discharge heat, which can cause cancer, it protects you. But then you can get melanin in other ways 
for instance, how did the uh, people in the Arctic uh, be so dark when they where did they get their melanin from? And some of them were very dark. I've actually met. Uh, I kind of I, I sort of dated her. It didn't go very well. She was a cannibal Indian from uh, from a cannibal Indian tribe in the Arctic <laughs> that I met down in San Diego of all places. Wow. Uh, Anyway, uh, melanin can be produced by rubbing your body, by uh, various other ways that they found out about. Now, that research disappeared. I found it in the library before they threw it out and made copies of uh, hundreds of pages of the research and how they did it. And they found out that melanin was not what protected you from sunburn that that you could if you gave a person cocaine they wouldn't make melanin in the sun and they wouldn't get burned at the same time so they did all kinds of experiments which i've written about in some of my blogs that t- overturn conventional uh physiology now they kind of rediscovered it i found in a medical book in 51 they found out hmm There's something with the adrenal glands that seemed to be related to the skin. But because there was nothing to hang it on, uh, it just disappeared again. And all that knowledge from Schenectady Station, which was the GE location at that time, uh, is lost. Except I found it in this one book that they started purging the good books at this osteopathic library in Fort Worth, threw them in the dumpster. So... uh, You could say it was a coup, a medical coup. All of the really good books. That was one of the most amazing libraries I've ever encountered. And when I went back to research there eight years later, the coup had occurred and they were dumping things in the dumpster. They wouldn't even sell the good stuff. They dumped it. So obviously that is a conspiracy theory. (laughs) (laughs) Well, well, let's let, let's start jumping a little bit like into the anthro anthropo. It's a anthropomorphology. <laughs> you got it. Because <laughs> as you said, there's like different categories, like you mentioned, intellectual, physical, and uh, and then like psychic, uh, kind of spiritual abilities. And I guess opening it up, like, do you think certain people are more gifted at certain? categories versus like being gifted in all of them is it usually kind of like an x-men thing where they have like their own individual superpowers what you've seen the x-men is a good analogy when i first saw that movie i thought about that in fact that people do have different abilities some of them natural and some of them don't find out about it till later i i'm thinking a former show I told you about the man who came up into the health food store while I was working on somebody. And then he went around and identified all of her problems. And he was a physicist whose wife did Tarot. And he thought it was all a bunch of baloney. Till down in his laboratory, he looked up at a mobile and moved it any way he wanted with his mind. And so that opened up a whole new uh, psychic self-defense workshops for him. And first I thought he was full of baloney till I saw him demonstrate that. So he had physical powers. Another friend of mine, who I haven't seen for a long time, named Mary Brennan. She was a veterinarian. She's written The Complete Dog, The Complete Horse. She's a very accomplished veterinarian. Uh, showed up every year at the Kentucky Derby to do horse neck adjustments and things of that nature for shakes and uh, a lot of people in Hawaii in the Middle East. And uh, But when I first met her, she was a client of mine and she was taking a workshop with me. But the person who hosted me had a sick cat. So she said, okay, give me the cat. She put the cat on her lap and she took a needle and stuck it in the cat acupuncture and then and the cat goes i'm not having this so she said excuse me uh i've got to talk the cat doesn't uh, want this needle i've got to talk to the cat so she bends her head down and i say oh no not one of these animal communicators because i've met a lot of fake ones definitely well she bends down i can't hear anything and she says cat says it's okay 
So she then sticks six or seven more needles in, and the cat doesn't even move. (laughs) And now I'm impressed. But then she says, okay, now uh, she takes the needles out. I'm going to adjust the cat. So she starts to torque the cat, and the cat now starts getting really uh, antsy and moving around. So she said, I got to talk to the cat again, bends down. Cat says it's okay. She takes that cat... (laughs) You hear six or seven vertebrae go, and the cat doesn't even move. Now, where have you ever seen a cat where you could do a adjustment like that, and the cat doesn't move? So I would count her as having some of those X powers. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I forgot about animal communicators. I, I think I've seen some shows on Animal Planet or something about that, and it's incredible. I mean, all sorts of animals, right? Uh, I think a lot of stories I've seen, though, are people that – grow up like like get a like whether it's a baby crocodile or a baby bear or, or some type of like really wild animal a tiger a chimpanzee and then kind of grow up with it when an animal kind of gets used to them and attached to them although i think some could still flip right like there's crazy chimpanzee stories of them turning on their owners <laughs> Yep. It, a lot of them I've found were fake, but uh, it exists. Uh, we have the horse whisperer up here. What's his name? Monty, whatever his name. You probably heard of him. He's famous. Uh, and he uh, he has a ranch north of here. I think he's a bit in his 90s now, and he's still whispering to horses. He went out one time, and they challenged him to get a wild horse and to horse whisper it back in one day. He did it. But he said it was so much stress, he's not doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard of, of people doing that to wild animals like like bears in the woods or moose or something or? i have there's legends and of course the uh probably one of the original stories is uh saint francis saint francis mm-hmm. would talk to the animals oh and uh uh vibrant gal's ex he <laughs> he communicated with animals yeah they come and land on his hand <laughs> And one liked him so much it would show up in the uh, in the windows for him. And another one, he was, uh, because he loves animals so much, he was so stricken when it would drive, he'd drive his pickup truck and it would fly along beside him. And one time it went under the wheels and uh, he was afraid to friend any birds after that. But he'd have a blue jay come into his, on his hand, and things like that, or birds of that nature. Wow. And so it definitely exists he's a perfect example of it in fact when we went and visited him on his farm he actually uh, the cows loved him <laughs> they, they just caught a glimpse of him a quarter mile away they'd come stampeding toward him because they wanted they wanted him to pet him <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a it's wow. a real deal there are people that have uh, connections with animals that are just amazing I, i've met a dog trainer same thing same thing a dog uh, i was the telephone man and this dog comes running at us to bite the heck out of us and he just bends down and says nice dog and the dog looks confused comes up and wags his tail and he pets it and he was a professional dog trainer when he wasn't a telephone man and he saved my me from getting bitten <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it was like two years ago now. It's been a while since I've seen a bear, but I was pretty close where I could see its face very clearly. It was a black bear just right next to my house. And it it was so interesting, the consciousness behind its eyes, because we locked eyes for a good amount of time. <laughs> and I bet if I just kept staring, I probably would have start hear, start hurting, uh, you know, hurting my head, basically, the bear <laughs> communicating with me. They're really interesting, but... uh. They are. Now, that the guy who was famous for that, they finally ate, ate mm-hmm. him. Uh, so you have to be careful because bears are like people. They have personalities. Uh, one of the most amazing stories, uh, I was camping on the other side of Yosemite with my girlfriend, and we met this couple who comes up there every year. And they said at one point they had a friend was uh, had a tent nearby, went out to go to the bathroom, bumped into a bear. And so she heard, stand still so the bear put one paw on one shoulder and a paw on the other shoulder and looked at her and she said she had no amount of time but but it seemed like an eternity (laughs) and then the bear took both paws off and wandered off she said she never went to the bathroom at night after that and stayed in her tent (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, I think uh, in those situations, they're probably so used to people, right? That they they have plenty of food where they're probably not voracious. And, you know, come to think of it, my son, uh, he has a uh, affinity with animals too, particularly mm -hmm. snakes. He has uh, he's had a, a twenty foot uh, python, eighteen foot and sixteen foot uh, uh, boa constrictors, and he lets them wrap around him. And he's so strong, he just when they get wise, he slaps them around and and takes them off. And the ordinary person, uh, they called him when he worked for Walmart in their main warehouse in Arkansas. They called him Caveman because truck drivers could come in and couldn't lift the doors with both hands and he'd lift it with one arm. <laughs> but he has a special connection with animals, loves animals. He has all kinds of animals living with him. He's up in Oregon now and I'm not sure how many animals he has today, but uh, he's been moving around a lot. So he, I think he gave up the snakes pretty much hmm. because he got too much flack in legalities, people taking them from him <laughs> illegally. <laughs> I'm, I'm finally getting an octopus after I don't know how many it must have been 15 years ago. I had some uh, later this week and I'm pretty excited to interact because they're talk about personality. Yeah, they uh, they are incredibly intelligent animals and they have that autonomic nervous system coming from the adrenal glands. They change colors and and uh, like a chameleon. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Well, you said uh, a little bit ago that some people discover their abilities like later in life. Um, do you think it's different for like what determines if someone has to train their ability to make it stronger versus it just being spontaneous? Do you think it's just different for everybody? I, th I think it is. And whether you call it karma, whether it's destiny, whatever it is, uh, when we're a sperm in an ovum, we are much more uh, programmable and what the parents are doing or even wishing for, and this has been proven, uh, often comes about. Sometimes the people, they know it instinctively and they resent it. But genius has been produced by people willing it that they're going to, and they, they read books to the fetus and all kinds of things. Uh, this has been pretty well proven that if you're in a foreign country, and the fetus is listening to French, they pick up French much easier or Spanish or whatever country you're going to be in. Uh, that's been shown. So people do come in with uh, different things. Some, some people have, they call it genetics, but I think it goes further than that. Uh, the Scottish Apollo, he was so strong, he could stand on a chair lift a person over his head and juggle balls with the other hand while he's standing on one chair on the edge of it and not falling over on the chair. Now, where does that kind of thing come from? This is definitely anthromaxomology. The mighty Adam was another example. He could break chains uh, and also uh, with his chest. And one time he challenged them to uh, drive at him at 80 miles an hour while he was tied to a chair in the middle of the road and as it's coming and said whatever you do do not stop and uh he barely made it in fact the, the, the car hit his foot and injured his foot but he broke loose of the chain but it took a, a split second more than he thought it could he could disarm people who said point the gun at me and, and pull the trigger and he could disarm them he was a superman that actually held an airplane back with his hair <laughs> where where the without ripping it off he warned another uh strong man not to try that stunt it was very dangerous and guess what the hair, the scalp was ripped off and the man died so uh, these type of things are very dangerous the mighty adam is uh one of my heroes this this guy was a tubercular kid he was dying and he overheard the doctor telling his mother that he didn't have long to live. So as a kid, he snuck into the, cir the circus and a, uh, a, a, one of the workmen beat him to a pulp. So a strong man called the mighty Valenko showed up and saw this. And he said, who did this? And the kid couldn't 
tell he could he couldn't identify him because he was like basically blind from all the uh, beating, but he could identify the voice. So Valenko beat that crap out of him and said, "You want to join the circus <laughs> and travel?" And he said, uh, "Yeah." He said, "Get permission from your parents." So he went and forged a note, brought some stuff in uh, in a uh, a sack like it was his clothes, which it wasn't, and he went all the way to India from uh, from uh, Yugoslavia, someplace like that, is where he left, and uh, and he met. The, the great Gama, who had 4,000 wrestling matches and never lost a single one, and he would wrestle trees to become super strong and eat like uh, pounds of almonds and all kinds of food that was uh, just unbelievable. So he taught him a lot of his techniques. And Valenko said, you're strong now, but you are destined to be stronger. Now, this is programming. When he came to the United States, he was strong. He, he did regular dock work and things like that, but he did some strong man demonstrations. Well, one time uh, he went in to visit a friend and the friend's son was kind of cuckoo and he shot him point blank in the middle of the forehead. Well, he went to a pharmacy and said, have you got anything for this? <laughs> He's got a bullet in his head. It made the, it made the, uh, the, the Houston headlines <laughs> that man shot in the middle of the head survived. Wow. And so he thought, if I'm strong like this, Belenko said I was destined to be stronger than other men. So he took a horseshoe that he could bend and ripped it in half. And after that, he could bite railroad spikes in half, dental mirrors, do all kinds of things that were considered supernatural. And the... Slim, the hammer man, far man, was a strong man who would use sledgehammers. And he would uh, he would go and see the mighty Adam and say, I know I'm stronger than you, but you can do stuff I can't do. And the mighty Adam said, my secret, finally he divulged it, is that I do it or I die. There's no in between. Mm -hmm. And so... Uh, Slim the Hammer Man, even though he broke his wrist 84 times, <laughs> became one of the greater strong men, too. <laughs> uh, I don't think he's alive anymore. But uh, anyway, that's obviously superpowers. Uh, the, 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 he had uh, the Mighty Adam had trucks roll over him with a, with a it's block over him while he was on a bed of nails, all kinds of things, uh, supported an entire piano player and the singers on top of the piano did all kinds of stunts. And of course, his hair was special where he would he learned to do his hair stunt by being hung from an airplane by the hair and flown around. And when he went to eat uh, lunch one time, his wife said, take off your hat. And when he did, she screamed because it had been elongated from all that stressing. <laughs> but he had a super, a super strong uh, scalp, obviously. Anyway, that's another example of someone who is was remarkable. Was it mostly programming for the Mighty Adam or was he also like training a lot? It seemed to, in his case, the programming was there. Of course, he did the physical uh, physical things. Now, he was tubercular. What Valenko made him do at 3 in the morning, which is interesting, lung time, tuberculosis, he would have him go out and lift a pail, and, and it would get heavier and heavier and heavier until finally he could lift more and more weight, and his tuberculosis went away. And uh, by the time he was in India, in India, it was gone. So he came back safe. His parents thought he was dead, by the way. He had disappeared for years. <laughs> he didn't come back for a few years. Then he went into the United States and they ended up in Houston. Wow. Have you heard stories of people uh, breathing underwater or at the or a minimum, like holding their breath for super long time? You know, and I can't validate this, but I studied with uh, Master Wu Dang Chen you know, from Wudang Mountain. And in his biography, and he told me the story too, a, a group of us, uh, when he was a child, he didn't know what you're not supposed to be able to do. So one time he dived in the water and he started chasing a fish. 
And the village thought he was drowned because he swam downriver for about a half a mile underwater, holding his breath for a half hour. And uh, when he came back to the village, he had to walk back a long ways. They were all grieving his death that he had drowned in the river. <laughs> so he had supernatural abilities. And uh, he uh, he demonstrated some of those minor ones to me when I was lucky enough to live at a ranch that friends of my own they owned and they needed someone to live on the property just to open the gate a mile away to let people in if there were servicemen or something like that to come. And so I lived on the ranch. Well, that's where Chen was going to do his workshops. So I just happened to be there. So he just said, join us. So I would, I went to these multiple workshops that were nine day workshops, one of them for professional Tai Chi instructors. <laughs> and I was, I was in it. We had to do am amazing exercises. But one of the things that I would say was supernatural that Chen showed us, he said that, uh, you come up to him and hold his shoulders. And when you hold his shoulders, make your move. In other words, attack him somehow by using one of the other hands or whatever you're going to do. And uh, he did it. And everybody who tried the attack, he would put his finger out and paralyze them with just one finger. So anyway, uh, when he did that, he could see that I was saying, God, I'd like to sit, try that to see if that works. And he said, Adam, come over here. So sure enough, twice. And just before I pushed, he touched me and I couldn't move, couldn't move. And then I did it, tried another way. And he pushed me in a different place and stopped me. Now, how do you know an exact point to stop that? And this is a man, by the way, who said a, a competent acupuncturist only needs one point because the flow of chi is like a river. And you just need to dam it at one place. If you stick the needles in after the water's broken the dam, what good does that do? That's why when people use all these needles, he said, if, if, if I, it was up to me to license an acupuncturist, if they needed more than three needles, I wouldn't license them. <laughs> and that's kind of a shock to a lot of acupuncturists who use multiple needles, some of them up to 20 or 30. <laughs> that's funny. I'm trying to remember the, the technique uh, and when I took Aikido, I think my sensei was telling us to visualize. It was like a root visualization, like connecting to the earth, um, like a tree and just like focusing our energy downward and then having someone push us before and after. And after it was a lot harder to push. Is that is are there some exercises like that that people could do at home to show how powerful the mind is to change change the physical laws and yeah you know back in the 70s that stuff was popular you put out your arm the unbendable arm but instead of trying to use strength you focus it on the horizon as far as far away as you could get but then it was definitely harder to push down the arm and the four people picking up you a person sitting in a chair with two fingers you know those type of techniques and there were people that you couldn't push their arm down so uh uh, I've seen examples of that when Chen was showing us how to generate chi. One thing he did is uh, the owners of the ranch bought him zazen pillows. He figured we're going to sit that, but he had nothing to do with pillows. But he decided he's going to show us how to generate chi. So we had to take these pillows and throw them at each other, two people back and forth as hard as we could. And one time I was tired. And by the way, Chen said, when you're tired, you're more apt to generate chi. So he wanted us not falling asleep, but not awake in that in-between subliminal state. Well, one time I threw the pillow and the guy was knocked back by it. He said, how did you do that? And I realized, wow, I generated chi. But as many times as I tried, as Yoda, Yoda said, do not try, do, I couldn't do it again. But it was an amazing feeling of just letting the pillow go and it knocked this guy back about two feet. Wow. <laughs> the Zazen pillow. <laughs> and yeah. also then Chen had us throw those pillows again at the horizon. As far as you can, throw it into the horizon. Throw it in the horizon. He claimed 
he could knock a person with one punch 40 feet away, but he would kill him. But his master showed him could have the person land alive 40 feet away, but he never had generated that technique. Wow. But Bruce Lee was, was into uh, some of those techniques, right? He was definitely <laughs> into supernatural techniques. And come to think of it, uh, in uh, anthropomaximology, I met a guy named Jack. Uh, Jack was a super martial artist. And he learned to move faster than the eye could track. And he would describe when he was a bouncer at one time how how a fight went, just a couple of punches, and it would take him like 10 minutes to describe everything that was going on. So I thought he's actually figured out a way to adjust time like that. And absolutely amazing. Uh, his students were the brown belts were better than most black belts. And one time a guy came to challenge him and he said, I understand you have the best kick, uh, roundhouse kick of anybody. And I'm here to challenge you. And he said, look, I don't have time for this. I don't do this kind of thing. So the guy took a swing at him in the classroom and Jack knocked him out. He dragged him out on the sidewalk and said, expect the unexpected. <laughs> that was one of his mottos. But he was an amazing guy. Now, one time he went to pick up his wife at uh, who worked in a hotel that his friend owned in Beaumont, Texas. When he went down there, he met a security guard and the security guard said, do you believe in uh, psychic powers? And uh, Jack kind of figured the skinny uh, security guard, you know, he was talking down to him. He told me I was actually just thinking, well, I'll, I'll humor him. And uh, then suddenly the security guard reached out and said, have you ever heard of people controlling other people's energy and put his hand on his stomach and paralyzed him? Oh. And he said after he was done, he had a burn mark on his abdomen and a burn mark in his back. Oh. And so <laughs> so uh, this is when I was telling him about kinesiology. He told me this story. So he went back the next day. Where is that security guard? Uh, he said he was just here for one day and he left. <laughs> so he never knew who that was. But Jack had yeah, had definitely powers that most people don't have. He was a he was also a writer and put himself through Gurdjieffian tasks like uh, like he would be a roofer and work for seven days without sleep push his body. So I would say definitely he was into anthropomaximology. <laughs> what could a person possibly do that you thought you couldn't do? Wow. That's pretty cool. Um, I think one of mine over the years has been like fat, fast reflexes, which I don't know, is that more of a nervous system thing or kind of mixed with Anthropomo maximology. <laughs> Anthropo. I'm going to practice saying that word. <laughs> what are your thoughts on like re, re, yeah reflex time and stuff? Or yeah, I think time? I think we we are born with some of that, but that can be increased. Uh, Jack mm -hmm. definitely did. He practiced uh, doing it uh, quickly. By the way, when he was in the navy, he uh, he he went to a Korean master. And the Korean master said, uh, I don't take uh, any other students but Koreans. So he said, can I show you something? And the master said, sure. So, you know, the heavy bag, when you hit the heavy bag, he hit it and knocked it way up to the ceiling with his bottom leg, not the top one. And the master said, you're accepted. <laughs> <laughs> so he learned a whole bunch of techniques other people didn't. He was uh, he was a remarkable man and practiced having reflexes faster than the eye could track. And he probably did develop it. Wow. Wait, you said bottom leg? What do you mean? Your bottom leg. Yeah. You know, the one you use to hit with the top leg, not with the bottom leg. How can you get torque out of that? <laughs> and by the way, several of my friends, Greg Whiteley, who is extraordinary himself, uh, he's the one that has all the property up uh, in, in your neck of the woods. Uh, and uh, Harlan McGee, 
And my friend Jimmy Gerard, who's extraordinary, Jimmy Gerard studied with him, never could be beat Jack, even though he could take eight blocks and break them with his hand, no spacers. <laughs> you know, wow. they usually use spacers so the break can give way. He could go through eight of them like that, and he still couldn't beat Jack because he thought, I can do this. I'm going to beat Jack. Jack okay. beat him every time. He couldn't. So he studied with Jack after that when he realized that <laughs> Jack knew wow. a lot more than he did. These these people all came out of Port Arthur, Texas, which is a remarkable place itself and has a history of having elves and all kinds of weird psychic woo-woo <laughs> stuff there. When I was there, I certainly met my share of woo-woo people, too. <laughs> um, I, I usually save the questions for last, but I'm thinking on each as we go down from physical, mental to the psychic, maybe I could ask throughout. Um, one of the listeners asked a good question on the physical topic. Does Adam think, given the right circumstances, people can regrow limbs, teeth, et cetera? You know, I, I think it's really rare, but I think it's been done. Uh, Ray Pete went into fingers being regrown by putting a, a pencil over it, to, uh, connecting it where it will grow back together. And so I think, I, I think there are people... Okay, I'm going to tell you the weirdest story, and I don't know whether to believe it. I spent uh, about a month in Sedona one time, and it was the weirdest month I ever heard. I've met all kinds of people. I could I could do a whole show on that one visit. But at one point, I met a doctor, a medical doctor, who claimed he had a guru who could take his arms off and put him back on again and his legs, too that he saw him once uh, once in India when he was went to India and he was sitting there with no legs and no arms and it was his guru. But then he saw him later with his arms and legs on. So I don't know about these stories. They're prevalent. You find them all over. And this guy was a perfectly believable guy. And I met him under such unusual circumstances anyway with uh, two psychic memes. Uh, we uh, kind of met by destiny uh, without explaining it. So... I think there are people in India who can do it, like the man who uh, they were burning someone, a young person at a funeral, and an old man ran down and jumped into the fire, and then the, the and then the young body ran out, but the old man had 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 the body of the of the burned person. You know who knows? And there's lots of stories in Yogananda about these type of miracles where people uh, 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 were resurrected from the dead. And uh, in fact, many cases after three days, a, per a person would come back from the dead. Uh, may maybe Mayor Baba, I forget the different stories there are. But but so there are extraordinary things that, of course, the speed of science says that can't be true. You know, this is all false. Uh, the amazing Randy and all those people say that's nonsense. Uh, mm -hmm. I actually got Nichols. What was his name? Jake something like Nichols kicked off a radio station because uh, I told them, I, I applaud you uh, exposing the fakes, but don't throw the ba baby out of the bathwater. So he started yelling at me that, you know, there's no such thing as psychic things and anything. He said, I've seen them. And so the moderator said, warned him. And then finally he said, I warned you, uh, you're off the show. Don't let the doorknob hit you where the bulldog bit you, is what he said. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a good segue into the mental uh, subject, kind of kind of mixed with physical. Someone asks, can sleep become optional? Yeah, you know, can, can what become optional? Uh, sleeping. Yes, you can like give up we, sleeping like yeah. uh, like that's that's one thing that both I know two people who gave up sleep. Uh, Swami Nitty Gritty, of course, who didn't sleep, but he would snore, but he was aware you couldn't sneak up on him. The other person was David Neal. Uh, I traveled with David Neal for over a month and he only lay down for 10 minutes one time to stretch his back. Now. I, when I, it was my turn to drive, we drove cross country all the way from Carpinteria, California to San Diego, and then all the way to the East Coast in Orangeburg, uh, South Carolina, and back again and around. And uh, during that time, he, he sat up the entire time, demonstrated psychic abilities, by the way, and uh, 
And when we would drive, like he would sit and meditate. But I would say, David, and he would right away be, yes. I said, do I go left or right here? He said, left. Okay. And he'd go back and meditate. So he meditated a lot. But when he was at home, he worked two jobs and uh, and then did all this other agricultural work on his own property at the same time. So he didn't he didn't sleep there. He would just kind of rest for 10 or 15 minutes in the truck and then drive on. So he had mastered it, which when Adano could do it, I thought, well, it's supernatural. He somehow has these powers. But when you take an ordinary person and make them able to do that, that was impressive to me that maybe I could do it. The closest I came, though, was uh, two or three hours a night and giving up night sleep one night. But now I'm back to eight hours, <laughs> six or eight hours anyway. Yeah, yeah, I'm far I'm far from that for sure. I find if I even go to bed past 1030 consistently, I just don't feel good. And I feel best if I go to bed by like 10 o'clock. Like for me, the timing is more important than how many hours they get, I find. The timing yeah. is important, definitely. Circadian rhythm. So best sleep, uh, apparently you get, it's worth two hours before midnight. My own mother told me that, and Adano <laughs> validated it. He said, ideally for people, we're meant to sleep five hours for the ordinary person who's not a yogi. 10 o'clock till long time at three o'clock in the morning. And a healthy person will bounce out of bed at three o'clock, meditate or read or study. If they want to be a genius, they study at that time. If they want to be enlightened, they meditate. It's the best time. Your lung meridian is your brain meridian. So that's what makes the, there's no, in the 12 meridians, there's no brain meridian. So they do have two master meridians that are called the brain governor and conception meridian that have to do with that. But your brain is controlled by the gallbladder and mostly the lung. You uh, turn off your lungs, you turn off your brain, your brain dead. <laughs> The gallbladder and the lungs. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And by wow. the way, the bladder is what controls your uh, intellect because the bladder, that's why smokers, cigarette smokers, long-term cigarette smokers will get bladder cancer. Well, how do they do that? <laughs> the bladder is an auxiliary lung and our lungs are basically a swim bladder, like in a submarine or in a fish that got, got specialized into avioli. Interesting. Well, good thing I cheek smokes my cigars. Now I'm always I'm always trying to mitigate because I I love my nicotine and tobacco. And I uh, I know you uh, quoted Warren Buffett before we started recording. It's it's amazing looking at these longevity stories and smoking, drinking. I mean, all of the above, right? It's yeah. like just oh, another I, exceptional I story is Mister Eats All. Yeah. He ate a Cessna. It took him two years. He ate bicycles. He ate co a coffin. He ate shopping carts. He ate razor blades on a regular ongoing basis. He ate a TV set. He ate, uh, you, get, you almost can't make chain, like 200 feet of chain he ate. Ate all this stuff. He, he only lived till 57 or so. And supposedly he died of a knife wound. Now, but they never specified, was the knife inside or outside of his body? Was he stabbed in New York City or? <laughs> oh, he was French. That's right. I like that when people, because people, you'll, you'll post things on Facebook and then people like want to debate you. And it's funny because you're off like on dietary stuff and you'll often reference Mr. Eats All. And it's really funny because they usually stop replying after that. They're just Especially like, I don't know where when omnivores, did you hear of Tarar, if I'm pronouncing his name right? Mm -hmm. He, as a teenager or even younger adolescent, he could eat one third of a cow. And later he performed on the street by eating cats whole, just chomping them down, eels whole, snakes whole, puppy dogs whole whole just ate him live right in the street to demonstrate stuff like that and they even accused him of maybe when he was in the hospital sneaking in and eating a one-year-old baby so he didn't live very long at all though i think i i don't know if he even made it to 30 but how could he do that how could can you imagine eating a live cat <laughs> it's like a human <laughs> snake <laughs> and snakes yeah and eels and what else did eels were his favorite he loved eels 
Wow. Raw eels, live eels. Live octopus? Did you do that? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. I don't. I, I don't know if he ate octopus or that's not. That's the I freakiest videos I've seen. People in like Japan or something eating live. That's that is super creepy to me. <laughs> you know, uh, when you mention that, I have a friend that's a Japanese. Actually, several of them, and the father knew how to do things that other people didn't do, know. He would catch octopuses by sweeping them up and biting their biting their head off or something like that to kill them because that's the only way you could kill them and also he mastered a way of opening macadamia night uh, nuts in Kauai, and he would not even tell his children how he did it but he didn't need any machinery and you know they're very hard not to uh, <laughs> to open he could open them with his hands somehow or his teeth whatever he was doing he had a secret technique that he wouldn't tell my friend uh, Elliot. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> yeah, I met him once. He was a, a very unusual man. He's on cosmic vacation now. Uh, I know that they, I've known the family for years. They've been two of them have been followers of Badano for years. Well, let's move on to the mental. One of the questions was, uh, "Have you bent uh, bent any spoons lately?" I think the other day it was the anniversary of the Matrix. I think that was like, what, 1999 when that movie came out? Right, right. That was, uh, you know, the uh, the mental thing, uh, we can all develop that. And I'll tell you a story. Uh, you probably heard of brain gym and some of these techniques that mm -hmm. actually increase your brain. They actually work. Well, I met a, a friend of mine was an optometrist, and he ended up, hosting experts and eyes when he lived in Colorado. And because of that, he could learn anything he wanted. So finally, ophthalmologists and eye surgeons told him that, you know more than, than the surgeons do. How do you learn all this? But he learned a technique called behavioral optometry. He was one of the pioneers in it. And it's when you do, you do a test to see how a person tracks with their eyes. Anybody can do this. You have a friend just move your your hand, and you should be able to smoothly your eyes should go back and forth without any any jump or glitch. And you you shouldn't be turning your neck. Many people they cannot not turn their neck because they can't make that transition without it. Well, a friend of mine had a daughter that was getting. D's and was about to flunk out of school when she was in, I'm guessing, the uh, eighth or ninth grade. And so I did that test, and she had a real jump. Now, I knew about uh, Brain Gym. I think it was called Educate back then. And uh, But I she, had, she lived in Hollywood. She had money. So I said, you got the money. If I were you, I would find a behavioral optometrist and give her eye training, and that's going to increase her scholastic abilities. So my friend did. And by the end of it, she became a straight A student. And I got to see the behavioral optometrist at work because they invited me to see sessions of it. It's quite complicated things involving red and green lenses, learning to make a, per, a single person double making double person single and doing all these kind of skills and they, it, that can be learned well she was a straight a student through high school through college and got into the film industry as a successful i'm not sure what she does in the film industry but uh but anyway i then uh saw on and this is an example of uh of uh Anthropomaximology. Do you remember the Marvel guy? What was his name that made Marvel comics that started the whole oh, thing? He so, did a yeah. show Lee. on people with special abilities. The monkey <laughs> man who could go up the uh, wall and all that stuff, jump over cars and things. St Stan Lee, I think. Is that Yeah, yeah. Stan Lee. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Exactly. <laughs> Stan Lee. Uh, one person they did was a person who could take the square root of anything, you know, and come up with the answer better than the computer could. So they wanted to see, and they put him uh, through a CAT scan, what part of the brain, the part of the brain that does that is you, 
must have been huge, they thought. It was ordinary size, and they found out he was doing the computations with his eyes. And I realized, wow, that's what happened. My friend Bob, the optometrist, actually was was uh, hired by the army to take people who were behind, like the Danny DeVito movie. But instead of teaching them books, he taught them the eye movements and brought their intelligence up where they could all successfully go into the army uh, with uh, without a glitch. And he was one of the pioneers in behavioral optometry. So I, I learned a lot from him at the time. Is that because you're changing the way that the brain processes information? Because a lot of it's coming through the eyes. Apparently so. The eyes are the main main (laughs) tracking for learning. So with our eyes, it it basically it's one of the most important brain organs that we can use. And of course, there are people who uh, the Sufi I studied with, he could be uh, said unusual, had psychic powers where he could roll his eyes wide open, completely up into his head where you saw nothing but white, but a wide open eye, not just partially open. And he would give you some kind of uh, Sufi darshan like that. And he could tell your reactions without his pupils being there, as he demonstrated to me one time. And, uh, And a Donald Lay could give darshan which he could look at you and just make you cry immediately or affect the entire room and put people asleep, whatever it did to various people. Darshan is a very real thing. He called it uh, uh, optical continuity where you could, uh, he said you can look through walls, which he claimed he had the ability to do because it was the same thing as you look through a window. That's a solid object. Well, you can do the same with a wall. So he would have us look at a wall every night for two or three hours. Just listen to the Prisoner of Love, which was a, <laughs> uh, a consciousness type of uh, uh, recording. And we would just stare at the wall. Sometimes we would stare at a blank TV screen to make our own movies. You know, the kind with all the like that. Mm. And uh and learn these abilities. I never learned to look through the wall. One time, one time, I think I did when I saw somebody coming around the corner and I could see him through the wall before he came. And uh, and I knew how he had a problem and I knew how to do it, with, whether that was karma or not. <laughs> <laughs> so what is Darshan? Because I, when I was living in Southern California, I was going to a ton of events that were like supernatural and just fun things. And one of them was a guy on stage, you know, looking at people and basically healing with his eyes. Is that what Darshan is? Or? Yeah, it, it, okay. it can be, it can be a lot of things you could, he, Darshan can transfer powers to you even. And, uh, uh, I received a lot of Darshan from Madonna Lay. And it was one of the most mysterious things when I first met him. I thought, well, what is he doing with his eyes? He just looks at me. He would start that and he would start to look at us slowly around the room. And suddenly I would just start crying. And sometimes I would cry for an hour and, and couldn't wow. stop. And uh, I just marveled at whatever that was. I met some other gurus that could do it too. One came into the room and I started crying before I saw him. And then I turned around on a hunch and there he was staring at me at the back of my head. That was Takar Singh, who was a uh, a Sant Mat type of uh, guru. I don't know much about his ability, but I had some strange connections with him uh, of that nature. And uh, I never really got Darshan from... Satchitananda, in, well, indirectly, you could you could feel the presence of the man. And Adnan had his own, I don't know what you would call that, with the eyeballs rolled up in his head, but uh, they had definitely energy. <laughs> uh, a listener asks, best way to heal from trauma? I know in all our previous shows, you've talked about it quite a bit, and there's a big mental component, right? Huge. What's that? That I would say that's the ba- basic. When people talk about emotional trauma, there's no such thing. Well, rarely 
I would give you maybe a couple of percentages. But it's a cognitive trigger event that sets it off. Because uh, if emotions were the problem, why would people hang themselves from hooks, whether you're an Indians or an L.A. nightclub where you get pay, you get uh, you pay to be hung up on meat hooks because people like it. And one guy went across a canyon on a conveyor belt with hooks all in them. And of course, they put hooks all in there. You know, what is that about? They're enjoying it. So how do you uh, torture a masochist? Take their pain away. <laughs> you know, so obviously the emotions work fine. It's the uh, and they're all deep in the brain, but it's the cognitive part of our brain, the gray matter that makes war and traumas and makes us judge something because some people like pain. So it is obviously is a value judgment. So one thing, uh, of course, I teach mind hacking where anybody can find out exactly what the shock is. And when you know what it is, sometimes the very knowing in a small percentage of instance will free the person and make them well immediately. Mostly it brings to light something they need to do to free themselves and what it takes. And sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes it's living your word. I'm going to move to Hawaii. I never did move to Hawaii and you're solved. You, all of this tapping of the brain, that's just a uh, band aid. You know, it makes you feel better, but it does not get rid of the trauma as anybody who does mind hacking will see. Now, for a person that can't mind hack, and, and I don't know why they don't, because it's so easy to learn. <laughs> uh, you yawn and stretch and automatically when we say we're under pressure, we're under 14.7 pounds of pressure at sea level. You're at a different a different level, a little lighter pressure. But all of those pressures make disease similar. If you want to study disease, study scuba diving, which you have all those pressurizations about breaking your uh, your uh, lungs. Hmm. Do you know that birds and bats die not from hitting those wind turbines? They die from the pressure being sucked out of their lungs when they approach the spinning blade. Wow. And suddenly their lungs explode just like a scuba diving. So breathing, the, the degree of one degree, people who have the ability to read barometric pressure can actually use that for intelligence for different versions to tell if a storm is coming, to tell if an earthquake is coming even, and all kinds of abilities off the simple pressure that is felt in the environment. We feel good with uh, positive ionization, negative ionization, but we forget about the pressurization, which is also how ESP and paranormal abilities work by pressure. Just like how does electricity work? Do you push one ball in in Los Angeles and then another ball falls out at the end? They really don't know. Well, it's the same with psychic abilities. Do you push here and you get it over there? I know Swami Nitty Gritty told me it has something to do with uh, carbon dioxide. That is the printer, just like the lead carbon in your pencil writes and the silica you can also write with like in computers, but eventually they will go to carbon computers because they're more uh, appropriate for human beings and faster. <laughs> wow. Yeah. The yawning and stretching is one of the coolest things I've learned from you. Cause I definitely noticed the difference. And um, I mean, I, I remember yawning in like gym, class years ago than when you were talking about it, it kind of made sense because school for me was very traumatic <laughs> i think for a lot of people it was i get a recent post you were saying that you used to spend what was it like 20 minutes every hour was it inverted is that what you're right. saying is that, is that... <laughs> well you don't was really it... have to but uh <laughs> i did it at one time to experiment because uh when i bought an inversion machine for a thousand dollars from Swami Nitty Gritty on credit because I didn't have that much money at the time. Uh, he told me I was really over enthusiastic. He said, do not spend more than 20 minutes at a time to go with every two hours of the acupuncture meridians, you know, for the brain. And so whenever I was awake, I did. I was writing newsletters. So I'd take it, go upside down on the machine and then uh, go write my newsletters. At one time, I used to do the bat shoes, but he said that can cause eyesight problems. 
And one time in a martial arts movie, uh, the guy was going to attack a building, this martial artist, and he wrapped his ankles. And I asked Adano, why is he wrapping his ankles? To protect his eyes. Because then he ran and rammed through with his head through the entire wall of the house and ran into the interior of the house in the movie. So uh, he do all these exotic things. After I hung at the gym, got those bat shoes, and I would go to sleep for a half hour in the gym. And then my eyesight mysteriously got bad. And it took 23 years to come back where I can see again without glasses again. But 23 years, I needed to have these glasses. And every time I got hugged, they got crushed, of course, or I woke up in the morning and put my hand on them. I went through about 50 pair of glasses probably when I had them. And then suddenly one day I was in San Diego in La Jolla and I looked at the paper and started reading it. And I thought, wow, I don't have my glasses on. I can read perfectly overnight. Suddenly it just came back. Why? Wow. I have no idea. Have you, because I've thought about, I have an inversion swing that I've used off and on for years. And I was thinking about getting back to it, even five minutes a day, if there's a way to do it safely. But I wonder with the eyesight thing, have you heard the theory that when you're upside down, you like redistribute like the mercury in your body, like all the stuff that's like sunk down to your feet, kind of, floats to your head. Have you heard that idea? <laughs> yes. And and I don't regard mercury as a threat because it actually has uh, therapeutic uh, effects in our body in minute amounts. Now, some are microscopic and say nanoscopic, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it, it takes a very small amount, but uh, lead, mercury, those things, Rodale believed that, that one day they'd find that all the elements have some kind of use, even the atomic elements. Uh, uh, Potassium is radioactive. One out of 40,000 potassium atoms is actually radioactive. Now, upside down, there is a danger if you have a, a tendency to stroke, you could possibly have that. But you can usually tell ahead of time and you could take some sugar or some oranges or something else to protect yourself from the clotting. Uh, when you're when you're a little more alkaline, you're less likely to clot. Acidity is what clots your blood, and uh, usually not dangerously, but it can if you have a particular problem. You could take ginger, which works better than warfarin to thin your blood. By the way, <laughs> ginger wow. does. So anyway, the upside down. If you look at an eye, uh, the people who claim that iridology doesn't work, then why does the eye change? Why, when you look at an older person, does it look like it's been at war compared (laughs) to a child's eyes? So, But here's what you often see. You see a white arcus senilis, which is called the aging arc. And then you see on the bottom a darker type of ring underneath. Well, I realize that's how ghee is made. When you make ghee in an oven, in a beaker, uh, you'll see the foam on the top and the junk on the bottom. It's exactly the same. So I believe that that upside down would make the Arcus not apt to stay in the same place. Since we are at zero or less uh, mercuries per square or whatever in the brain compared to 120 at our feet when we stand at attention for a while, five minutes maybe. And, and so when we move, we distribute that going upside down like Satchitananda for a half hour every morning actually brings that into alignment where if a person would live upside down a lot, you should see the Arca Sinellis begin to form up on the top at the bottom of the eye and you should see maybe it doesn't form at all so i think it's really good the yogis have done it for centuries uh bats bats uh, right and bats <laughs> their bats go now now uh andrew fletcher with his sleeping at an angle i think i think that has benefits for people with the gerd and heart problems but my take is why do they have gerd in the first place 
look at the cognitive trigger events, and look at the physiology. Because often it's a warning that you're taking a food. There's usually a primary food that starts it that will kick off the, 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 the chain, and then all the other foods will follow. Uh, I had serious GERD. I fixed it by freeform dancing. It's a physical problem. The stomach is supposed to lay sideways, not J-shaped like we make it like a fish hook, because then the, the, uh, the bottom, the, the, the pylorus, uh, actually hangs below the valve. How do you get the stuff out of your stomach unless you stand on your head, actually, with, a, with our types of stomach? It would help people a lot. If some people's stomach is so pendulous it hangs down to their crotch. <laughs> and, uh, and then how's the stuff going to get out unless you go sideways or upside down or whatever? If well, the stomach used that... to be sideways, it would run right out. Was it you that posted, because Andrew Fletcher's thing is – your head is higher. Was yep, it you that he posted the maybe higher. the opposite might be good or the head lower or something? Yeah, I'm <laughs> saying that I'm saying that I'm a lowered guy. But <laughs> with Andrew Fletcher, I did learn from Swami Nitty Gritty the following thing. Uh, if you have a heart problem, it's good to lie on your back with your head higher. But if you have a, the same heart problem, and you roll over on your stomach, it's bad for your heart. Uh Now, if you have a gallbladder problem, it's bad for your gallbladder, which often is mistaken for a heart problem, by the way. If you lie on your uh, back with your head elevated, it's bad for your gallbladder. If you're going to do that, then you roll over on your stomach to protect your gallbladder. So there are exceptions to the rule, and it's not just 100% this and 100% that. So I think it can be therapeutic to uh, lie like that. And Donald Lay taught us to sleep in a recliner chair, which I did many times. He said to prepare us for space travel. (laughs) And so the trick was to make the chair where it was just going to fall this way or that way and balance it and go to sleep in that way now of course he didn't he slept i suppose but he was awake while he slept he uh, always was awake if i was in a room and we were supposedly sleeping he would sit up sometimes cross-legged at night and uh every time i would wake up and peek at him suddenly he'd open his eyes and peek back at me (laughs) so he knew when i was looking at him even (laughs) yeah i uh i he didn't sleep he didn't sleep but he would make this huge uh, amount of snoring so loud that people would get really offended at it deliberately just to, I would say he doesn't sleep. (laughs) (laughs) Off he would go. That's funny. You say that last night, I think I'm an intermittent snorer, not all night, but uh, occasionally. And supposedly the story is that that's cutting off uh, oxygen to your brain when you're, when you're mouth breathing. That's what I hear. I don't know. Last night I used a a new little nasal dilator thing that I'm trying where it's basically you apply like a magnet on each side uh, with tape. So there's like one magnet and then you put a brace on. And I guess the brace with the magnets kind of just gently pulls it open. And I felt better this morning. So (laughs) who knows? (laughs) You know, Adonis told us that snoring was necessary to get the Delta brain wave. Now, I started researching that because if I tell people that, uh, where did you read that? Oh, Swami Nitty Gritty told me, who the heck is that guy? So I found a book by an expert on snoring, forgot the name of it. And it turns out there's about 30 different reasons, but one of them is to get Delta brainwave. So it's oh. not, so most people are going to have snoring. It is a blockage and obstruction. Hmm. There's a variety of things. Even some elements can be mas- missing in the diet. Uh, I choose to remember all the different ways he had, but it was quite a collection. But one of them definitely was to generate a Delta brainwave. So wow. a lot of times uh, when a person tells you one way to do it, you should research the downside because sometimes you better know all the details. Um, mm. For instance, there is a uh, what is a fish? Uh, 
a flounder or one of those fishes, a shark will avoid you. But it's only one type of flounder that will do it. Wow. Or fluke, and and don't get I I don't even remember what the fish is now. <laughs> I'm making that up, <laughs> but uh, the shark actually in the Red Sea, uh, it will stop uh, that particular fish in the Red Sea will stop shark sharks from attacking you. But the other ones, my if someone tries that other fish that they get off the California coast, they're going to be in for a rude awakening. <laughs> <laughs> well, since we're talking about snoring, uh, talking about sleep for a little bit. I I rarely remember my dreams like one or two a year. And I think we've talked about dreaming before. And I I think I got into lucid dreaming when I was like 10 or 11 because my older brother introduced me to a forum and I started journaling. And that was a fun, uh, that was like kind of my introduction to real spirituality. I think like connecting actually with myself. And uh, do you think lucid dreaming and, and dreaming in general can help with our mental development? Yes, uh, I experimented with that uh, even before I read uh, about the Sonoy dreaming technique. Um, I had an experience where I woke up and looked at the ceiling, clear as anything, and it was in my 18-foot trailer that I lived in while I was working for Thrifty Drugstore in 1960-61. But then suddenly I opened a second set of eyes and I'm in Redding, California, living in a house. And I thought, wow, how did that happen? Well, later I read uh, Carlos Castaneda, study your hands and that will make you become awake in your dreams. So I studied that technique. Then when I got a hold of the Sonoy technique, I finally developed the uh, ability to do it oh, twice a uh, Twice a month was the maximum I could do. And at first I dreamed I was conscious in my dream, but I was unconsciously <laughs> dreaming about being conscious. And then I woke up, I got fooled. But the first time it happened, uh, the hell's angels were chasing me with guns and I'm running like anything. And I came to the point where you wake up to get out of the dream. And I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is a dream. Turn around. So I turned around and grabbed the gun out of the Hells Angels that was the first guy and started chasing the whole gang in my dream. And then I lost it and became unconscious. So I realized, wow, think of the potential. Gurdjieff said if one thing could be different, everything could be different. So I became a fanatic about it. One of the ways to develop conscious dreaming is to watch birds and planes and think of levitating during your conscious dream. This worked really well for me too. And then when you start floating off the ground in your dream, you say, wait a minute, human beings can't fly. They can't levitate. <laughs> this is a dream. <laughs> and then, then you start being awake. And it's very hard because your unconscious wants to pull you back and you come back and forth. It's like a battle. Mm -hmm. uh, the most I've been able to do it maybe it was two or three minutes. And that was a, a lot. But everything gets realer instead of less real. It's remarkable. You could hold leaves in your hand, all kinds of things, as I did at times. And then you start to go away and you come back and eventually you do get lost. But yeah, I think I think it develops the brain. And uh, it's very important to do. Yeah, I might have told this story in one of our previous shows, but just really quick uh, down in Southern California, I, I met a guy that um, supposedly could change the direction of fire in a, you know, a fire pit and uh, with his mind and, you know, move objects with telekinesis. And he said, anyone can develop it via lucid dreaming, uh, actually practicing in the lucid dream to develop those abilities in real life. And he said it was attached to the emotion like the feeling is what he said. So if you match the feeling in the dream in real life, then you could do similar things. It's interesting. Yes. In fact, a man named Don Leonard, who is mm -hmm. an example also of anthropomaximology, by the way, a salient example, is a friend of mine. I met him in Sufi camp, and he taught me how to rock out of my body to astral project. And the first time I tried it, we were at Sufi camp uh, for six weeks up in the mountains. And uh, I dreamed that uh, 
Adnan Sarhan, who was running the workshop, came and blew in my ear and gave me pain. And I saw this green design, kind of an off green color in a specific design. So I asked Don when I woke up, what do you think that means? And he said, listen to Adnan. So I thought, well, that makes, that's a good interpretation as any. So in that workshop, uh, when he would chant or give us instructions, we did like a lot of physical exercises. I called it Sufi boot camp. Uh, I would, instead of listening to what he was saying, I would concentrate on the sound of his voice. And so I concentrated on concentrated on it. At the end of the morning session, I looked up on the wall and it was a painting. It was the design in my dream. And now I'm freaked out. I said, that's the exact design I saw and the same colors and everything. He later made it into a postcard, by the way. Uh, but then I started wow. thinking, you know, you, your subconscious saw it. You dreamed it. Mm -hmm. What's the big deal? So then we come back for the evening session. Adnan says, tonight, we're not going to do exercises. We're going to stare at this painting. <laughs> and now, whoa, wait a minute. So we stared at that freaking painting for three hours. And then at the end, he would give his version of Di Darshan with the eyes. And we would all, like good soupy, sit around cross-legged and rock back and forth. So this time, I... I stood and I asked him with my mind, I said, who are you really? So he's coming with the eyes, the white back and forth. And as he comes by me, his eyes pop down and he winks at me and they go back up again. <laughs> and then I go like, what the heck? And he does it a second time and he does it a third time. It was years later I asked him, what the heck was that about? He, he said, I'll tell you sometime. Wow. <laughs> he never did. <laughs> so that's the supernatural that he was able to do something with that or was in my dreams or however he did that. And uh, that's an example of maxo, uh, uh, anthropo maximology. <laughs> but Don Leonard, by the way, is so extraordinary. I'm not going to go into specific some specific details because they, they might be personal, but let's say there was a city in the desert called, uh, that is now called Abba, Abba, Abba Dhabi. What is it? He built it. He built it. He was responsible for all this. He's traveled around the world in forbidden cities and, and countries where you're not supposed to, to live. He started a yoga school in, uh, in Colorado where uh, in, in Colorado Springs, where they said no one's going to go to a yoga school. It was the largest yoga school west of the Mississippi. Uh, he said, I make a mountain of Shakti and I get whatever I want. He said, it's so easy. You have no idea. And so his uh, he always had made enough money so that he could take his trips. He liked to go to Prague and like to Costa Rica twice a year, but not enough to be uh, in the radar. He just made enough to do what he did. Had numerous girlfriends, uh, had just about dream life. And he kept telling me, you know, why don't you do this? It's so easy to make a mountain of Shakti. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a he's an extraordinary, extraordinary person. <laughs> I, I should have asked this when you mentioned mind hacking, but a, li a listener asked, um, can you give a guide for self-hypnotizing technique for healing generational curses or trauma? Uh, let's see. For self-hypnotizing? You know, it's like affirmations. My friend Greg Whiteley, of course, is a master of that. He's created his reality out of affirmations. And I've seen him manifest stuff in front of my eyes, remarkably so, almost immediately after asking for it. Now, Adano did that, too. His affirmation was, I am a winner. That's all. Just repeat, I am a winner over and over and over. And then things fall into place with no specifics. Greg is to, he says that we have hardware and software. He said, if you say, I want a new car, it should just appear. There's no, there should be no lag in it. Uh, so what is wrong with the hardware that you can't do that? So he went back and found out 
why you were too close to your parents, why you this, why you that, and found those kind of things. Getting rid of the hardware, and then the software would work. And it's obviously worked for him because he's manifested. Uh, he has a greater scuba diving library than, uh, and has won awards over, uh, what's his name, the son of, uh, uh, what is the famous scuba diver? Costo. Oh, Jock Costo. Yeah. Yeah. son. Yeah. Costo's son lives here in Montecito, by the way, oh, wow. today. Uh, but anyway, he won over, over the son that lives here. Greg won uh, an award for his underwater film of feeding sharks. Uh, and uh, he did two underwater films and he has an underwater library from trips all over the world. Palau, the Red Sea, the Galapagos, the Caribbean, uh, the uh, the Great Barrier Reef. You can't, you almost can't name where he's been <laughs> to wow. doing these places. Now he's obsessed with, uh, well, last I heard, he's, he's now just farming up in Idaho. He was uh, taking pictures of uh, polar bears. He was oh. right up against the polar bears taking photos of them. Wow. And uh, one place that he was, a week later, a couple was there and they got eaten by polar wow. bears. So yeah, it's, a, it's a dangerous type of uh, profession. I have but to now get... he's mostly into fly fishing and farming up in Idaho. Oh, cool. Yeah, I just learned that there's like the lake up in North Idaho is the fifth deepest in the U.S., actually. It's very wild. deep, very deep. <laughs> He's north of there, and uh, that lake also was used as a training base for the U.S. Army. And uh, there were anomalies up there where strep didn't have a rhythm. They couldn't figure out why. So it's a mysterious place. There are also uh, new age ideas that there is a channel underneath the lake that goes to San Francisco and one goes to Washington (laughs) on, on all these underwater caverns, which I frankly think it's BS, but who knows? But uh, the yeah. lake is, it was a long time before they found out how deep it is, before they dropped something down 1,200 feet or something like yeah. that. So they, they took submarines up there and, and rode them around to test them out. And other things, it was one of the, the biggest Navy bases in the United States, was in <laughs> Idaho of all places. <laughs> yeah, I need to start exploring because I've only done ocean dives with very poor visibility in La Jolla years ago. But I, I just heard freshwater lakes tend to be kind of boring because there's not as much, you know, fish. And then uh, you're mostly wreck diving, I think. So you're looking at, at Yeah, stuff in-, in the Caribbean. <laughs> so Greg was bored with the Caribbean. He likes sharks. He, he, in the Great Barrier Reef, uh, uh, one attacked him and uh, the, uh, the, uh, his fin had was bitten off. <laughs> it got it got his fin. Yeah. One of the first times he went uh, uh, diving in Kauai, they found whales and things like that. And at one point, they saw that their uh, their dive master leading them down in the dive got freaked out, and there was a tiger shot shark. And oh. just at the last minute, as the tiger shark was coming at him, dolphins. <laughs> drove the tiger shark off. And that was one of his very first official dives in ocean water. You know what freaks me out more than sharks uh, for me is the um, the squid, uh, Humboldt squid in the Sea of Cortez. Hmm. I think on like the red demons. Look that up. Like they'll pull down divers just like Yikes. hundreds of feet super quick and pop their ears. And they're probably just tired of being pulled up, you know, in boats. Yeah, there's a lot of dangers under there for uh, certain types of eels and stuff that are moray, moray eels and things like that are very dangerous. Uh, I I, uh, I never did learn to scuba dive, though I went down once. I was the only, uh, because I wasn't accredited, I was the only snorkeler in the bunch. But at one point I was down about 30 feet and Greg said, you know, uh, it's easier to scuba dive than come down 30 feet here. <laughs> yeah, I I ordered on one of those Kickstarter things. It's like, a, I think it's been out for a while, but it's like Snooba or something. It's like a a balloon that floats at the surface with a long tube, where if you're going shallow, you don't need a tank and all this heavy stuff, just fins essentially, you know. Um, let's see, where can we take this now for the next? Uh... <laughs> Someone asked, uh, are there 
older or ancient books that you know of that are about unlocking human potential? A lot of them. Uh, I wrote a book called Mesmerism and Miracles, which basically is collecting old, uh, uh, old things from books. Hmm. And uh, I think it can be a dangerous thing being mesmerized or hypnotized by another person. I don't really recommend it. And the Donald Lay said, you're connected. It's closer than sex. Milton Erickson, the expert in uh, who's often cited in hypnotism, actually said that once you connect with a person, you're connected for life. That's actually in the book. That was wow. even more extreme than Donald Lay said. So I have been hypnotized a couple of times and I wanted to explore, explore past lives and he wouldn't do it. He, he did a Freudian yeah. thing. My TM mantra came in. My transcendental meditation mantra came in when it was when I was hypnotized, and I think it protected me from something. I don't know. That wow. might be a figment of my imagination, but it was interesting that I, that happened. And uh, so, but sometimes mesmerism has happened spontaneously. Uh, Swami Nitty talked about unlocking our Superman hood. A Superman ship that we have this ability and we sell ourselves short. And a perfect example that is actually in my mesmerism book, it comes from the AMA journal back in about, I'm guessing 1905, something of that nature. There was a man who was dying. All his organs were failing and he was in bed and couldn't get out of the bed. So on a rainy night uh, at one in the morning, the guy in the bed beside him starts to yell for the nurse. And he's missing. He's not in the bed. So they found the window was open. And so they thought, oh, my God, he committed suicide. He jumped out the way. He managed to get enough energy to run out. So they looked out and... Uh, no body any place totally disappeared they're looking all night for the where the hell did he go he's not there he had gotten out on the six inch ledge and was walking around it all night from back and forth completely around the building back and forth and then finally at five in the morning he comes in the window all wet and soaked and they uh now how did he do that and then he goes back and lies in bed unconscious again now this is in the ama journal how did this guy gain the in the balance to walk a ledge around the building when he wasn't a tight wire walker or anything? Another example is a man who was sleepwalking and walking over a log over a river. And his wife was so worried, she screamed, woke him up, and he fell off and died because he couldn't do that in normal life. So we have these powers that when people were mesmerisms, they found they could read with their eyes shut in the dark and do all kinds of phenomenal supernatural things, know about events at a distance and actually be mesmerized by connecting with a person by uh, a thousand miles away. Once you made a connection, you were connected a thousand miles away. That's not hypnotism. <laughs> wow. I wanted to ask you, Adam, about CO2 and carbon dioxide as credit to, to Ray Pete, his work on that was probably one of my top three favorite teachings that he shared, the power of CO2 is incredible. I've been playing around with carbon dioxide, and I know this is one of your passions. Uh, Ray Pete had awesome information on the power of CO2, which is often demonized, uh, like a lot of things that Ray Pete talked about, because mm. it's seen as a waste product. But what I've been messing around with is uh, CO2 baths. Like I think Ray said even he used a trash bag on the couch one time in an interview and would just pump in carbon dioxide gas and it basically you just need an enclosed area. Uh, but there's a company that I connected with, they make essentially a dry suit, you know, so it's a neck gasket and then like kitchen gloves and pretty much only your head's out. But there's a, a little valve where you can punch, uh, uh, you suck the air out. So you're like shrink wrapped and then you pump in <laughs> carbon dioxide gas from a, from a tank um, and then he, you could also breathe it, I think, up to 8%. And I've been playing around with both. And I might sell my hyperbaric 
chamber. I'm starting to wonder if that's kind of a gimmick, overpriced, if CO2 has all the benefits. And I think you said it's safer. Is that right? Than, than oxygen well, if you, could, uh, if you could add carbon dioxide to it, and I wonder, what about bag breathing in the hyperbaric chamber? Mm. Wouldn't yeah. you get the best of both worlds? Uh, <laughs> but I, I don't have a, an expert to consult about that. To, to, that uh, at one time, I had one of the it, one of my best buddies was a uh, probably the leading expert in hyperbaric chambers, George Wellington Adams. Uh, in the nineteen twenties, maybe thirties, actually they started even earlier messing with them. But a lot of them were not built very well. They blew up and killed people. But finally, they perfected it where they built a four-story, completely hyperbaric hospital. Four stories in Missouri, I believe it was. And uh, they treated patients in all these rooms. They had it loaded with patients. It was uh, financed by a prominent uh, multimillionaire at the time, uh, made all kinds of news. It was therapeutic. And then came the Second World War, and they broke it down for the metal, for tanks and other wartime supplies, and it was forgotten. Well, my friend George Wellington uh, Adams was a uh, the leather tiger, he was called, because he was at Bada Canal, that kind of stuff. Uh, he uh, he uh, was a deep sea diver, ultimately even trained the astronauts to swim in swimming pool to get ready for zero gravity. And he was all, all over the world deep sea diving. Well, he uh, decided to bring it back. And so he popularized it again. It was he himself <laughs> that did it. And uh, they started doing it again. And what you see the results now, he worked with the Navy in uh, Maryland, was it? And in Antonio uh, to be a, a doctor center. The hyper chamber would do that kind of work. And of course, uh, it's uh, routine for a nitrogen uh, problem in uh, San Diego. They have they have a portable one that's come out to your house. Anyway, George knew that it worked on uh, everything from gangrene to, to uh, all problems. And, uh, uh, and uh, but anyway, he popularized it. And at one time, he was working with uh, Donald Lay, Swami Nitty Gritty, to build a deprivation chamber combined with a hyperbaric chamber. He didn't know about the, uh, the oxygen for the brain. And Scientific American even now has uh, has validated what Ray Pete's talking about, that uh, that it does cause subtle brain damage and breaking the capillaries when you do it. You know, the brain heals, though. It's not they make it seem the experts make it seem like, uh, oh, you can't heal the brain once the cells don't. That's a bunch of nonsense. It's been disproven that the brain actually in a 90 year old is still one of the most active places for for generation. Uh, But anyway, uh, it seems there would be some way to combine it where you could kind of out by back breathing to put a device with you. Uh, But I wouldn't recommend doing that until I find out the details, if there's any downside to that, you know, or danger of back breathing in a hyperbaric chamber. Interesting. Yeah. The one, the one I use, it's, um, like you wear the mask and there's a little bag that has the oxygen pumped in. So I'd imagine I'm rebreathing a lot of my carbon dioxide, but I don't know what percent it is. Um, but it, it's interesting because I've heard you talk a lot about the spiritual or energetic properties of uh, CO2 and oxygen. And I'm wondering like how those relate to this topic of Anthropo, anthropo maximology. Maximology, yeah. <laughs> it, you know, it uh, it actually does. Swami Nitty Gritty was really good about information on consciousness. And he taught that oxygen is consciousness, hydrogen is power, otherwise known as desire, uh, nitrogen is will. So if you put the hydrogen in Nitrogen together, you get nitrate, and you get uh, you get basically willpower, and then carbon dioxide was attachment. So carbon dioxide for most people uh, weighs them down; it brings them into their karma and fixates them. But 
if you can use it for immortality, according to Adon Haley, because if you can, uh, since it makes attachment, you can make attachment to your body uh-huh. by using it for uh, to build uh, anabolically your body. Now, repeat said an interesting thing. If you want to therapize and get more carbon dioxide to an air, you put a tourniquet around it, and you can actually heal an air faster by putting a tourniquet like around your uh, your bicep or whatever, so they lower your arm well. Here's the catch. Uh, Ray Pete said, if you put a tourniquet around your, uh, say, your upper arm, and you do bicep curls, you're going to build the muscle better than you would otherwise. But if you put the tourniquet around there and you don't exercise, you get cancer. And this validates what Adonal Lay was saying, that uh, cancer is the secret of growth and psychic powers that you can, you can actually navigate it. So carbon dioxide is highly associated with it. Otherwise, as Swami Nitty Gritty would say, uh, there's no ownership in this world. It, it's franchised to us uh, as stewards to uh, take care of it and take care of our body while we're here forever, however long we wish to stay. The Babaji factor is there supposed to be people who live up in the Himalayas that are uh, 500 years old, 1,000 years old, 200 years old, whatever the different accounts uh, say. I think some of that is true. I think longevity uh, can be achieved like that. I I've met one person who claimed he knew how to do that, but I I don't know. I never saw any demonstrations. And I've met people who can hold their breath for four minutes without, without, and then you can take your hands off their nostril and mouth and they're not breathing hard. So that long, but supposedly there's people that can hold their breath for 24 hours. And again, that procur I was telling you about that would be buried and was proven. I mean, you can, find the evidence from the uh, British mil- military that they were fascinated. Of course, it would be yeah. an advantage to the military to hide under the ground and come out of the ground and <laughs> surprise people by not breathing for a day until the enemy is all camped above them. <laughs> yeah, I was reading something a week or two ago on if you have uh, so I've been looking back into air quality and I was talking to an expert friend and he was talking about how the pressurization change in your house from just simply having all your windows closed can be pretty dramatic versus even having one window open. But I was also looking into like the carbon dioxide buildup in that situation when you have all your house, you know, all your windows closed up too. And uh, you would think it would have have a benefit right with having higher co2 in in the air but uh i feel better just having at least one window open you know so i could get the vocs out and all that stuff so uh i've wondered about that too and my mother was a fanatic about that no matter how cold it was she was swim at night she would open a window by her bed and to let the air come in and breathe that but at the same time you look at uh, a cat I've seen a cat in 10 degrees and they curl up. You can't even see them. They look like they disappear into themselves. And obviously their nose is under the, uh, in their fur. (laughs) Now I've experimented with, uh, with sleeping under the covers and I've noticed you get more heat that way by breathing in and out inside the covers. And sometimes I've noticed I had, uh, a problem with it. It bothered me and other times it helped me. So there's cycles of the body. We probably don't understand and how that works. And I'm in favor. If it makes your body feel good within reason, you go with it unless you're an alcoholic and you say the the booze makes you uh, uh, good or or like Elvis felt good by taking all those pills all the time. But, uh, but anyway, I think carbon dioxide is a very important thing to research. I think it has to do with longevity, maybe even immortality, as people say, and certainly healing. And uh, I, I mean, I've found uh, in my book on carbon dioxide, I went into one chapter was uh, as long as one chapter on healing from an old book 
was longer than the entire rest of the book. It was so fascinating about how they had huge baths she would go to and, and, and stay in the bath. They had pools. They had geysers in Germany that became healing centers, quite a few of them, because carbon dioxide would come out of the earth. So they basically uh, piped it into these baths. If you had enough money, you said hey, you had your own private bath. You didn't have to take off your clothes. They healed cancer. They healed women's problems. They healed all kinds of degrees, all kinds of uh, conditions. And it was validated not only in that book, but they gave references to uh, known uh, experts at the time. I mean, Lavoisier, people like that, you know, who were involved in this. And they validated it. They also validated mesmerism, by the way, which is a whole other story. But uh, but carbon dioxide is one of the secrets of health and longevity. And I think Ray Pete was really on to uh, important things about it. Yeah, I'm glad I was able to kind of uh, try both hyperbaric oxygen therapy and then CO2 therapy and see the difference. And it's interesting, say Swami Nidigrady said oxygen is consciousness and CO2 is attachment because I found the CO2 to be uh, so much more, like much more relaxing than the oxygen therapy, like where I would almost fall asleep from getting bathed in the carbon dioxide, like the the relaxation used, aspect. Yeah, they, they used to use the carbon dioxide as a uh, sedative therapy i found that when when because nitty gritty was talking about that so much i would look up things like that and kind of douse them in libraries and i found a lot of information about how it's a sedative what's interesting about the gases and including the unsociable gases like helium and argon and things like that is that they don't act chemically <laughs> they don't act oh. at all but uh, yet they have an effect on our body so uh, one of the most powerful sedatives, uh, let's see, which one was it? It's not or Krypton. Krypton is one of the most powerful sedatives that they actually use as, as a sedative in medicine. And yet it doesn't do anything chemically. It's unsociable is what they call it. So carbon dioxide is much like that. And yet it affects our chemistry profoundly. And, uh, the, and when you pressurize it by changes in pressure through negative and positive ionization, you can get remarkable effects and healings. Wow. Well, you mentioned uh, pressure. And one thing I've always noticed, like if I've gone through like a stressful uh, time in my life, just prolonged for, you know, months or a year after I leave the stressful situation, uh, whether it's a relationship, an environment, uh, I have like this depressurization <laughs> effect where um, just like, you know, releasing gas, like burping uh, uh, mainly. And I just feel like I'm deflating like a balloon. And uh, I'm curious, the, there's probably some relationship there with uh, energetics and, and, and psychic abilities and stuff. What are your thoughts on that? You know, uh, we have a book on bloat, too. Because uh, the secret of weight gain and loss is actually bloat. Uh, Adano Lay once pointed to a – he gave a, uh, a class on solar in the health food store I managed in uh, Carpinteria. And at one point he pointed to a guy in a can and said, you give me that guy for 15 or 20 minutes and I'll get him to burp and yawn all of, all of that muscle away. <laughs> so actually – Muscle is formed. It's a way of uh, you hear about the pump. Arnold Schwarzenegger was so fascinated with uh, the pump. He said it was almost as good as orgasm to him. But but the pump, you blowed up. When I worked out at the gym, wow, I got a body. Oh, no, it's going away. <laughs> you stop. Well, what what bodybuilders do is basically trap the pump for good or bad. And you can sculpt yourself with the pulp. And I was fascinated with a uh, with a uh, circus man who could inflate himself and gain like about what seemed to be 30 or 40 pounds and then deflate himself again and do it several times a night as a show. So uh, 
we give because we bloat seems like a uh, oh that's bad for people I have people don't get bloat only animals do well animals can swell up with huge bellies and huge uh, throughout their body and women they're inferior according to the patriarchal society so they can have menstrual bloat or premenstrual bloat <laughs> but men can't have bloat but actually bloat is the secret of bodybuilding because calories are really not functional they they uh, you can't tell if you're burning calories for metabolism or is it just oxidation that's why guys like me could stuff food in my body and not gain any weight. And yet when I was under stress over having a fight with a girlfriend and having to hitch back from Orange County all the way to Carpinteria and got stuck overnight in a culvert, I had uh, two beers. People hitchhiking gave me a beer and, uh, and I bought, had enough money tootsie roll so i had a touch roll well i get home and i'm all worried oh my god i'm having trouble with weight anyway so i'm gonna weigh myself on the scale i'm 10 pounds heavier i was staying with my mother so i said this can't be right you, the scale must be off you get on well she was exactly the same way so i mistakenly thought even though uh, donald i had explained how bloat works that my metabolism has changed. I can finally gain muscle and weight. So I force fed myself about three times what I normally ate. And to my horror, every day, some of those pounds came off. So by the end of a week of stuffing myself, I was my, my weight before I got sleeping in the culvert and stressed. Wow. So that's when I realized that, hmm. Swami Nitty Gritty knows what he's talking about. And since then, I've seen many cases of people gaining weight through shock and also gaining weight by using alternate technologies that we, uh, we, we that are not taught by mainstream medicine at all. <laughs> so can you burp and yawn, but keep your muscle? Is that possible? <laughs> you can still do it, but particularly the useful muscles because strength and, uh, and, uh, uh, muscles are two different things. So you can make a happy compromise. Now, I was fascinated with bodybuilding because of the, the differences that they could make. Normal nu nutrition isn't interested in a change of uh, one degree of temperature in your body, what it can do. Because bodybuilders are looking for an edge and space medicine too. They want a quarter of a degree of Fahrenheit, whatever. Uh, I became fascinated by how one, I, I knew a lot of bodybuilders myself. And uh, uh, one of them, one of them that I didn't know, but I read about, he would compete in powerlifting in one part of the season and gain a hundred pounds for it. And then as a bodybuilder and lose a hundred pounds for it. And I thought, now I think that's really tough on the, the, the system. But I was amazed that he could do it, that that was a that was an option that you could do and that he did it season after season after season. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> so we oh. we have mysteries in the body. And one of the things they teach is uh, if you drink cold liquids, you will lose weight because it makes the calories burn more. Now, that sounds logical, but logic doesn't always work with the body. What it does is burn calories, but you get gain weight. You bloat up by gaining weight. And I, I've proved that. I would, I would show bodybuilders. You do uh, squats, which are, involve a lot of the body. You get as much as the body as you can involved in a full body movement. And then go drink cold water. And... Uh, they would gain four or five pounds and they, they couldn't believe it. <laughs> I said, the, the idea is to trap that. I did. I had done that too as a demonstration, drinking a half a glass, that's about four ounces of uh, cold water and gaining four pounds after a workout. Wow. So I proved it to myself and then I would teach some of these other guys. So I, I, I was not really a very... Uh, uh, Went for, ready for any kind of contest or anything, but I was advising the professional bodybuilders on how to gain weight and lose weight, and they were using the techniques I was teaching. <laughs> Are the effects amplified if it's cold carbonated water? 
like a yeah, soda. But now the carbonated <laughs> Adano they warned about carbonation being a problem. But if you use it correctly, yes, then it can be. Because they're thinking you even though it can cause gas, you get like a home mistake homeopathic. It doesn't we have to be a small amount. It just has to be a dose of the poison already taken. So when people get burned, they say place on it. That's the worst thing you can do. Mm. What you want to do is actually put it back in the in boiling water for a fraction of a second. Gurdjieff knew the secret and healed somebody that way. And I found by, uh, by uh, reading uh, the homeopathy, uh, homeopathy books, uh, Hahnemann, that he knew about that and that the chefs could heal their bur- serious burns in one day instead of months that they could with the other method. And of course, I was taught to do the ice and just made a, it made a mess because I burned myself in various uh, fry cook type jobs and things like that that I had back in the, the <laughs> 60s and 70s. Wow. Well, well, on this 50s. topic, we, we've talked about the physical, the mental, and then I wanted to get into like the psychic, spiritual aspects of human potential. And I think one of our last two shows, we talked about uh, like telekinesis and telepathy a little bit. And I might've shared, like I've had experiences several times in my life of just spontaneous uh, expression of those abilities. Like I wasn't trying or straining. It just happened at an absolutely random time when I was at like Costco demoing coconut water at a booth or something. (laughs) And uh, so I guess kind of jumping in, uh, is there is there a way for someone to uh, train, let's just say telepathy, for example, if they want to strengthen that ability, or do you think it's more of a spontaneous thing? There are people that come in with greater and lesser abilities, but it can be trained. And I think I have my list here. <laughs> well, I'll remember it if I don't find it. I think this is it. But I'm really starting to, I'm going to start a journal. And uh, it's going to be basically muscle and life force journal. Uh, Someone asked me to write a bodybuilding book because I have had a lot of experience in that, even though I've never been a professional bodybuilder. Uh, But I realized I've got so much information on it. I'm going to do a journal so I can do it piecemeal because organization has always been my problem. (laughs) When we wrote the yes, no, maybe book, fortunately, my co-author was an organizer. (laughs) I just gave (laughs) the information and she put it all together. Uh, Journals are more my style because you can go it and make it like a training course. But for people that don't know, I'll, I'll tell you the greatest secret I learned. Uh, I met a doctor who was a cardiac surgery a surgeon in Spain, very famous, and uh, he taught a method. He he found out that we have uh, what they're called what are called anastomoses. They're where your capillaries uh, exchange from your arteries to your veins, and they particularly. Uh, occur in the fingers so he noticed that the psychic people tend to have as many as 50 anastomoses in a fingernail and the non-psychic people could have as little as four that there was a huge difference between it but then he noticed that psychics tended to use their hands in special ways so he offered me the job of being the united states uh representative and uh founder of his uh, his uh, system of psychic building at the time. This is a long time ago. Now, when I when he first showed me the slides and the examples and all the psychics he had worked with around the world, I call I, I was so excited. I ran back to a, a pay phone, which is was going on in the 70s. And I called to Donald Lay and I said, uh, this guy, the capillaries in the fingers, blah, blah. He said, well, that's nothing, brother. That's the Akabani points out of acupuncture that he's talking about. <laughs> so, so I realized 
that's what those points are at the why they, they're so important at the end of the fingertips that they call them Akabani points and other names uh, that you'll find for them. But anyway, his uh, Dr. Sanchez Perez was his name. Uh, his system was basically take your hands and pretend. Well, here's how you practice. Wet your hands and shake the water off with your hands. And that will activate the four or five, if that's all you got, and give you psychic abilities. That's why people like uh, the man who used to take, uh, put a Polaroid camera up to his forehead and take pictures of whatever he was thinking about. And I actually met a, a woman in Sedona whose mother, and she showed me the Polaroid pictures. She would take a picture of a tree and she'd get Mother Mary. She'd take a picture of a house. She'd get Mother Mary. So she had all these pictures of Mother Mary that appeared on the on nothing. She couldn't take the picture of a regular thing. She showed me all these pictures. They were Polaroids. How can you fake it? And, and by the way, uh, they were very unusual people. Sedona is one of the craziest. You, you, you tip the, the phone man with a joss sticks, for God's sake. It's so bizarre. You meet all kinds of people up there. A lot of them are phony, but boy, I tell you, I've met real, real things up there, real <laughs> genuine psychics, paranormal people, like whatever. They're up there. <laughs> yeah, I had trouble sleeping. I think it was one of the first few nights because the, the mineral content what is uh, a lot of iron in the ground or something. I think that's it because uh, when when I first went up there, I went up with my girlfriend on spiritual Groundhog Day. What was that? The harmonic convergence. You remember that? <laughs> so we went up there and I was kind of dissing it like meditation is in within your body. So I went out on a rock and sat and meditated and got a high. <laughs> I said, Whoa, there is really something with these rocks. And one time I was hiking with another friend of mine uh, and uh, I found a place. I said, can you feel it? There's something here. So a hiker came along and said, ah, so you found uh, you found one of the vortexes that they don't usually tell you about. It was on Bell Rock. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, so we didn't know it was a vortex. And this guy said, that's a vortex. And, and we could feel it. Yeah. So uh, there is energy up there. And, and, and you can, again, uh, generate it by actually uh, shaking the fingertips. As simple as that. Uh, oh. There's other ways, too, of gaining energy. A lot of them come out of yoga that are similar to the fingertips. You go into a shower and you go, you raise your hands above your head in the shower and they get wet. So this is very similar, something I learned way before I even met Sanchez Perez. Uh, you extend your hands up and get them wet and you go, um, swaha. And the swaha, you shake the water off down and you do it seven times. And this will give you uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, connection with people. You'll connect with people much easier because your barriers are down, your aura, whatever you want to call it, goes down. So I used to do Om Swaha quite often at one point. I haven't done it lately because I'm a hermit. I don't have anyone <laughs> to uh, really connect with, even though you can connect with a distance at a distance with the ESP, paranormal, all that kind of stuff. Wow. But uh, Anyway, we can go into some other <laughs> techniques, too, because there are a lot of techniques that people can learn and be learned to do either psychic defense, uh, energy work, and regeneration, which to me is really important. To fact. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah. I, do you think uh, it's helpful to train in groups like I used to do in Southern California, yeah. like – go and and do different practices with people just different uh uh like psychic trainings and different experiments versus just practicing alone yes i was fortunate enough to hang out with john lewis and that was his mm. idea he called it triads that uh, mm. he said first of all he said triads breed problems when you have even numbers 
you have a stable relationship. As soon as you get uneven, if three people are involved, there's trouble. But also, you get power from it. And that fits with how the uh, periodic table works. The stable elements are the even ones, and the unstable ones are the odd ones, something Ravisi noticed and other people have noticed too. So when you get together, how is that worded? When two or three are gathered in his name, basically, that's... The key. I think Louie mentioned that, too, back in the day. But anyway, when you get people together, you can develop, especially of like-mindedness, and you chant like a word together. Like if a huge group does OM, I've seen a room just totally get calmed out. Satchadananda used to do that, uh, where he'd have people chant before. And Adana Lay would synchronize people by, let us meditate before the satsang. Well, we would meditate for about 20 minutes and everybody had questions, but it wiped our minds so clean, we wouldn't have any, the questions disappeared. And so then he would say, well, if there's no questions, we'll just adjourn for the night. And everybody would raise their hand and make up a question <laughs> so, that he, so that we didn't have to adjourn. And then the questions would come back gradually, but we'd be unified as a group. So yes, there is a group consciousness, a crowd consciousness. You can call it mass formation and psychosis in its worst level, but you can also use it to generate energy. Hmm. Maybe that's why people are attracted to concerts. I'm not personally. That's like I'd rather be home alone. But a lot of people are attracted to going to music concerts, right? Uh, I used to be, too, uh, on some rock concerts. And, of course, I used to go to parades, but mostly to look for women. <laughs> I didn't care much about the parade. Uh, it never did work for me very well. But but anyway, yeah, the uh, – the, uh, uh, I'm going to pronounce this guy's name incorrectly, but I'm going to try. Guy de Massapin, uh was a French writer who wrote uh, extensively about consciousness. And he said he had to stay away from crowds because they would pull him into the mid range. And he said, there's no way to avoid it in a crowd. So he said to achieve greatness, uh, you have to be alone. You're in a perfect place for that <laughs> because you get, he said he couldn't stop being drawn into it. So one time he landed his boat someplace in Marseille and uh, someplace like that. And uh, there was a wedding going on. And he said, no matter what, he couldn't stop uh, being drawn to what was going on at the wedding. And his consciousness was captured. So he got the heck out of there after that, and he said how bad it could be. But it can also be good if you get like-minded people. Gurdjieff formed groups like that that would that would do exercises together, uh, exercises that combined uh, emotional, like you would feel love, and you would do math at the same time. And you would do complicated physical movements at the same time. And if you were given the stop, uh, if, if Gurdjieff said stop, everybody had to stop, even if they fell off the stage at Madison Square Garden, where they actually performed and fell off the stage and didn't get hurt. So, uh, wow. so he particularly was big on groups because he said our minds tend to distract us where we get unreal ideas and someone else will say hey you're full of crap <laughs> and bring you back to reality so that you can start again i had that problem around nitty gritty and he'd come back and if i was right he'd correct me but otherwise he basically said you're full of crap you know that that's not true uh, and uh, so it's good to have someone as a mirror that is not in our hypnotic state because we are all, all programmed to a degree uh, are you familiar with Scott Adams? Uh, he's uh, I disagree with most of what he says. He's the creator of Dilbert, and oh, he got yeah. okay. kicked yeah. off. Uh, he got he kicked off his job and everything for making comments that uh, are anti woke. <laughs> <laughs> and I disagree with uh, 
I would say at least half of what he says it actually vehemently, but he is a master of hypnosis and he's a master of programming, NLP and these kind of things. And one of the things he said two days ago was if people knew how powerful hypnotists were, they'd kill us all. <laughs> and that's actually people have no idea that they're under a spell. The last four years proved it, for God's sake, that you can tell the public anything and they will go for it. Guy, uh, uh, other writers have uh, have mentioned that 100 years ago, that if you, all you have to do is come up with a narrative and people will believe anything when they're under shock. So that's why they want to keep the fear form going so that people are not they blend into the crowd for protection. It's a natural mm -hmm. herd instinct. You get a bunch of animals together, there's a predator, the herd goes right together and glues itself together so that they can guard each other and uh, watch their other sixes, uh, so to speak, their buttocks. <laughs> yeah. So over the weekend, someone texted me a, a bit shoot video. I guess there's a, a theory going around that you know, the Mac address you have like on your iPhone or if you have a Mac desktop, the theory is that that's like beaming you with frequencies that are making people, like you said, the last four years give the same scripted response. I don't know if it's that complicated. I think it's just simple hypnosis right, <laughs> from television and, and media. There's two things going. <laughs> the uh, The CIA and basically the State Department uh since the creel commission back in the first world war to get people into the first world war have invented uh you know have copied major uh programming techniques they got got from the mesmerists the mesmerists were able to use energy in a way animal magnetism that is denied today except by people who do muscle response testing, that's actually animal magnetism. Uh, and the, uh, but the programming usually is done with just auto-suggestion, or, or not auto-suggestion, suggestion on the crowd. And now people are so attuned to whether it's Fox News or CNN, whatever their source is, even social media, Facebook, they, they will parrot things without thinking it out. One of the things I do like about Scott Adams, he says, we can't assume anything. We have to take it as a probability. And he's very good at teaching people reasoning. So even though we get mad at this guy, we listen to him pretty religiously. He's uh, coffee with Scott Adams on, uh, on uh, YouTube even. They haven't kicked him off yet, though he's in danger. He's been demonetized, I think, there and things like well, that. You know, but, for Halloween one year, I dressed as Dilbert. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, Dilbert was – but he said now he can he, – he has freed Dilbert because before he had to, uh, to keep it within – if he suggested a – uh, title is his uh, agent said no don't do that <laughs> you're going to get in trouble well in this last show he did he got kicked off all of the media got demonetized debanked all kinds of crap like that has happened to a lot of people and he said it actually freed me you know i i just had to say what i had to say and though i don't agree with all he has to say a lot of it i don't atomic power and things like that but uh, but he also is a good source of how to reason and how no one really can reason that we're all in a swoon and we don't realize it. And the trick is to take the red pill and figure out how to get out of this. Most people, as Gurdjieff explained it, consciousness works like this. And I've had these kind of experiences. Imagine someone comes and hits you over the head with a blackjack and they cart you away to a magical island. And there is uh, harems and there is flamingos and there's everything. And it's a paradise and there's, there's pineapple and papaya and everything. And it's wonderful. Then they come and hit you on the head again, drag you back. And so you try to tell people, hey, there's this world. Uh, you're crazy. There's no such thing. Plato's cave, you know, they, yep. they, they, I think they killed the guy. <laughs> they came in and tried to say there's a world out there. Uh, that are not shadows and so most people are stuck in that they'll have this profound experience holy cow how did that happen 
But when they explain it to people, they think they're insane. <laughs> but yeah. Georgia yeah. had that analogy, and he said, what you have to learn is how you need a map, how to get to that place so you can take other people, too, and tell them. <laughs> he said, to escape prison, you need someone who's been out of prison to tell you that there is an outside the prison. Because in our life, we think we're in a matrix like Neo. And the Matrix is a perfect movie. The first one is a perfect example of that. He thought, it, would he change anything by the corporation he worked for if he convinced them to do good? No, because it was all a projection, a projection. And as Yogananda said, find the projectionist. <laughs> Otherwise, nothing else is going to work. <laughs> Well, this is a, this is a good a good segue. I think uh, one of my friends sent in a question: Will we end up living in a Star Wars universe, i.e., space travel, the ability to live on other planets, etc.? Because I was I was a Star Wars kid, not a Star Trek kid. I had all the toys, and I would do these imaginary huge battles, and even made stop motion films with them, uh, all the little creatures. And I, I find th those movies. Uh, really interesting that series i mean the first the original ones you know the first like you know, i'd say even six were decent uh you know uh i believe we do have the potential the problem is we're very close to blowing ourselves off the planet according to swami nitty gritty he claimed that uh, we've blown up many planets before. This isn't the first one, and then we'll be back again. I, I can't validate that. That was his story. And uh, But I think when you look at the inventions, who would have guessed that we can have a cell phone now that uh, has, what, uh, something like a billion uh, megabytes or whatever they've got now? They're going into, I forget, they're way past gigabytes and the. <laughs> Yikabytes or whatever they call them. <laughs> I'm not a technologist, but uh, but I am a kind of a futurist. I've always seen that future, but couldn't press the buttons to get there. That's why I need someone like Vibrant Gal to help me push the buttons to get there. I was raised as a child on Buck Rogers of the 25th century, Flash Gordon, Captain Video and the Video Rangers. I had my video ring. Uh, I had, uh, what else was it? Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, all that kind of stuff. Beyond Mars, Twin Earths, all these kind of comics and shows and TV shows. So I was way into it and was one of the youngest members of the Bergen County Astronomy uh, Society. We had, I think, either the biggest refractive telescope in the country or the world to look to not reflective but re refractive and i've seen close up the moons of jupiter and the craters on the moon and all kinds of things so i was big into it and we had an expert an expert with quote marks say because we're limited in our technology we won't have a satellite up for 50,000 years, and we won't be on the moon for 100,000 years. Well, I think he got that slightly wrong, like about 49,000 so many years uh, off. And uh, so I'm a technologist, and I think we have the possibility, even though I think Elon Musk is one of them. Uh, because he's into a lot of things I won't mention on the show to get you in trouble. Uh, but I like when he he talks to people as earthlings <laughs> and his ideas, I think, are good. I think we can go to Mars. I think like one expert said, though, and, and a legitimate expert, why go to the moon first? That doesn't make any sense. We can go directly to Mars from here. It's nonsense to go to the moon and delay us and then have to make two launches to get to Mars. So uh, I think it can be done. I think suspended animation is possible. Ray Pete was not big on uh, hibernation, but there's hibernation research going on at the University of Seattle, at Washington at Seattle. Uh, that that we actually have genes in us for hibernation in the uh, spleen pancreas area. 
And it's something also, uh, Donald Lay said, your psychic powers come from the spleen pancreas, your uh, your ability to do paranormal uh, things, and your hibernation gene is in there too. Wow. Yeah, one of my favorite movies was uh, uh, was Sylvester Stallone, uh, where he goes into hibernation with uh, Wesley oh, Snipes. Do you remember that? that? <laughs> it, it's actually a parody. It is so funny. All of, you know, the cholesterol people hiding under the earth and all that. Yeah, that was one of my favorite movies, too. <laughs> yeah, I, I've thought about that quite a bit. If we could, uh, you know, get, go in a cryo chamber and suspended animation and come back in 500 years. Yeah, uh, it's it's kind of a scary thought because would it still be around at that time, right? <laughs> right. There's been several movies with uh, Idiocracy was one of them, and <laughs> yeah. uh, the uh, Mel Gibson movie too uh, on that mm-hmm. theme. Uh, Ray Pete was not into hibernation, but Swampy Nitty Gritty certainly was, and I think there's advantages to both sta- states. By the way, in a personal correspondence with Ray. He didn't think much of yawning either. Hmm. And of course, uh, maybe I could have explained the concept more to him because the yawning I'm talking about, if you yawn for less than seven seconds, you basically clear the body and you're, it's like a zero sum game. You don't get any place. Hmm. But once you extend that into a controlled yawn, you get power out of it. And your breath control has a lot to do with your body control and your environmental control. So the technique that Adano taught us is you inhale for, say, 10 seconds, which is at least beyond seven seconds. And then you hold your breath for 10 seconds. And then you exhale for 10 seconds. And then you uh, hold your breath at the bottom, too. That's a 40-second yawn now when you do it that much. And that's hard for most people to do. So most people will do like an eight-second, uh, eight seconds. But really, a yawn, usually the whole thing takes place in seven seconds. So if I've explained it to that uh, way closer to buteco breathing and some of those techniques, perhaps Ray would have uh, – I just never wrote him back on that. <laughs> that's pretty interesting. Um Kind of a, a random question here. Someone asked, what is your go-to lunch? What did, what did I what? What's your go-to uh, lunch? Like, What do you eat for lunch usually? Oh, for lunch. <laughs> uh, because I, if I was a meat eater, I'd be eating beef or I'd be eating chicken or I'd be eating one of the four-legged animals, basically. <laughs> because I don't, I get my protein mostly from a dairy and from uh, – Things like mung bean sprouts, even sprouts were approved by Ray Pete. He didn't think much of beans, but Vibrant Gal has been really insistent. And we've been eating mung bean sprouts a lot for lunch with some raw cheese. Or in my case, I can't get goat cheese uh, raw. So I buy a type of uh, goat cheese that I uh, that is pasteurized, I guess. And uh, so it's things like cheese and uh, uh, mung bean sprouts, maybe lentils sometimes, uh, cauliflower, uh, various uh, broccoli. Right, she's helping me here. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 oh, we we like tomatoes. Yeah, tomatoes, tomatoes peppers, cucumbers. She's she's there. <laughs> she's got the list going there. <laughs> yeah. And we we are lucky enough to get it at a farmer's market here from mm-hmm. local farmers. So we get really good stuff. We know it's legitimate. A lot of so-called organic stuff and whole foods in places that are not real. And they have a peel and all kinds of crap on them now. God knows what they're doing. Yeah, my potatoes are sprouting in my greenhouse already. It's only it's like a week and now they're already uh, all green coming out of the dirt. It's exciting. But I've been battling aphids on my uh on my vegetables, these little white creatures. And uh, it seems like there's a lot of solutions, but it's funny getting into gardening. You start to learn about all the different things. And I think you had told me ladybugs, which right now you can't order them. So I put in like assassin bug eggs and uh, green fly or some other bug. But some people told me like, uh, take my uh, cigar butts and make a solution, like put it in a bottle and then Mm. spray the plants 
because I guess nicotine's an insecticide, right? So. Uh, yeah, I heard things like that. When I was a Sufi and at Sufi camp, uh, for I called it Sufi boot camp, uh, we used a combination of garlic spray and cayenne spray. And we ate the whole time. Back then, as a Sufi, we were supposed to eat very light and even encouraged in fasting. And so basically, we took the vegetables out of the garden and raw was the salad and if you wanted a soup we cooked them <laughs> it was the same thing <laughs> and that's all we got uh, except some dates we were allowed because obviously soupies eat dates <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see someone asked do you wish you had always been a vegetarian someone asked you know, I, I was glad to go through the uh, the process of uh, doing it. I was a vegetarian for 14 years, and Swami Nitty Gritty got me out of doing it, even though he was originally a vegetarian due to his wife at that time, I think is what brought him into it. Uh, he told me what we understand in the suffering of animals also happens with vegetables and even individual minerals mineral mm -hmm. fatigue is before the mineral dies mm -hmm. and even uh, one of my friends amber on facebook suggested maybe that's what's happening on boeing <laughs> the metal fatigue is dying and all this metal being reused and everything is actually yep. dying and parts are falling off engine uh, beginning doors everything just falling off i i can't read the uh i checked the headlines on the New York Post, and every day something falls off a Boeing plane. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you can you elaborate on that? You said mineral fatigue is before the mineral dies. So, is it the idea like everything's conscious, including rocks and individual elements? And you're saying the metal the metals, if they're being like overworked, they get tired. Is that is that the idea? Yes, and it and it can actually die, and so. The person who proved that and got rejected by the British for it was an Indian man named that they eventually made Sir, uh, Sir Jagadish Chandra Bose, B-O-S-E. Now, I first read about him in Yogananda's uh, Autobiography of a Yogi. So I thought this is pretty metaphysical stuff. But then I found out that he's a hero in India, a friend of Luther Burbank, and uh, who, who grew vegetables with consciousness. He loved the spikes off of cactus and was able to do it. And he had all kinds of remarkable techniques related to that. He actually took his vegetables to school, believe it or not. <laughs> it's stuff that now scientists would say that's nonsense, but not back then. But what Bose did, he did test on plants first and found out that they can think. Now, back then, the scientists said, you got to have a nervous system. Well, as a reflexologist, I can tell you that's not true. <laughs> you don't need a nervous system. Oxygen is consciousness by itself. Anything that has oxygen and it's floating around in so-called vacuous space is consciousness. So what Bose did is say that the same things that we go through when death happen to a plant and that hmm. plants are actually afraid of death. They do not like it. A lot of that plant research has been validated Today, some of that communication goes by fungus connecting the, uh, the plants, uh, like in an aspen forest, it's actually one entire, like a beehive or a termite or ant uh, camp. And uh, a famous, uh, what was the uh, scientist, Lowell something or other, wrote a book called Supernature about that type of uh, uh, function. But we have it. And is consciousness, again, the crowd or is it the individual? Does a red blood cell have free will to do what it wants? Cancer certainly takes over and decides it's going to do what it wants and that can become a problem. But then Bose went and found out that individual metals had consciousness. And he found that tin was the smartest of them all. <laughs> and zinc wasn't that smart, <laughs> even though it's necessary for our body, but by itself. Tin is a very unusual metal, too. It determined uh, it it defeated uh, Napoleon attacking Russia. His uh, 
his royal uniform man uh, put tin buttons on all the buttons. Well, when tin gets to a certain uh, degree, it breaks down. It just breaks down. So all of his soldiers had no buttons on their uniforms. They couldn't button them up. Wow. And uh, he executed his haberdasher <laughs> over that. Uh, <laughs> and tin also in the Arctic, people went up with tin water tanks or gasoline tanks, and it just deteriorated, and they had water or gasoline all over, and they died. So tin is an unusual mineral. Platinum was also a smart mineral he talked about, and he wrote about it extensively, and he tested it. He had a machine that was a million times more powerful than they had today until recently now. Uh, they have instruments that can validate what he's saying. And so now they they haven't come out about tin yet, but they're suggesting it. But they know about plants. Uh, there was a case in Africa, uh, this plant, uh, all the animals in this forest started dying. And what happened, there was a, a severe drought, and the plants were usually nibbled on. They didn't mind that. But the animals were starving, so they started eating the whole plants. So the plants broadcast to the other plants with infra combination infrared and a combination of salicylates that, hey, we got to get rid of these animals. And so they all developed a powerful poison and killed all the animals. So this uh, expert came out and saw all these dead animals. How do you explain them? And that turned out to be the explanation. The plants had assassin that killed them. <laughs> wow. I, I used to be into the fruitarian movement and their idea is, you know, the, the fruit tree like doesn't mind you eating the fruit, but vegetables, I mean, especially like a root vegetable, you're, taking the whole thing. Have you heard that concept? Definitely have heard that concept. <laughs> and according to Adonal Lay, the longest living you're going to be is fruitarian. But if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to kill yourself faster <laughs> because you have to be able to balance protein, uh, carbohydrate, and, uh, and fat accurately and get fat out of the vegetables too like a fruit like uh, avocado is technically a fruit so if you don't know what you're doing you're going to shorten your lifespan so he said first you should start maybe as a meat eater learn how to be uh, get that from a, as a vegetarian which is easier and then ultimately a fruitarian but he said most people have no business being a fruitarian he recommended solar would start to get you in the rhythm and as you understood it, when I first studied with him, I asked if I could teach solar. He said, you don't know enough <laughs> yet. And so later, though, he would recommend me once I really applied myself then, because I realized I don't really I can't really field all questions about why this works and why this doesn't work. How about Eskimos? How did they do solar? All those questions I couldn't answer at that time. So after a while, after taking I took his solar one over a hundred times. <laughs> and, and my friend, Melissa Wolf said, how can you stand going to this class over and over and over again? And I said, when I can teach it as well as he can, I will stop going. <laughs> and then I took solar two about 20 or 30 times and solar three, a few times and solar four only twice, because that was the last solar, uh, he gave before he went on his cosmic vacation. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of a random one. What role does music play in healing? And what are Adam's favorite bands? Hmm. I, I've always loved music. And of course, being raised in the rock and roll era of Elvis <laughs> Presley, we just watched a documentary about Elvis <laughs> last night, by the way. Uh, I loved Hound Dog and all those uh uh, type of music and all of the take me to the hop type of stuff. I think that was really good music. And then I did also like when we got into the Beatles area, a lot of the, the Jim Morrison, the first Doors a album, I can't find a song I dislike on that. I was a fan of the Doors of certain Dylan songs, uh, things like that. I believe sound is the most powerful healer if you know about the audible life stream 
which you'll hear a buzzing in your ear, which some people call tinnitus. Mm -hmm. But if you can direct it into your right ear, it builds your body. It's another technique for bodybuilding. And eventually, I read that you would hear it in the center of your forehead because we have cells that perform hearing function all over our body, like the Russian housewives who learned to feel colors with their fingers and tell what colors they were by sensitivity. Uh, we'll see lizards with an eyeball at the end of their tongue. We see all these kind of things. We have the potential through stem cells that Ray Pete was correct about. We can make our own stem cells. We don't need stem cells. If you know what you're doing, you can rebuild your body like that. That's one thing we agreed on 100%. So uh, basically, uh, the Audible Life stream, I finally met this crusty old chiropractor in Grants Pass, Oregon, who said, how can I get rid of this? The, the, the sound is driving me crazy, but it's coming from the center of my forehead. I said, oh, my God, this is a real thing. <laughs> it really exists. So I told them something I heard Adonis say when they heard the hearing in the right ear. He said, since it's not in the left ear, which can indicate high blood pressure and things like that, it's in the, in the, in the left ear. It's in the right ear. So uh, I would not cure you even if I knew how to do it, because it took me 18 years to achieve that. So I thought, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> so I repeated it to this chiropractor who was uh, a really very interesting guy, very interesting guy. So if someone tells you they have tinnitus, do you ask which ear? And then if they say the left ear, do you often start talking about high blood pressure solutions or what's kind of your approach to tinnitus? Yes, uh, because the... The ears are a reflex to the kidneys. And if you, uh, if you take your hand, your thumb like this, you'll notice that it forms a kidney. It's a kidney. And I found out myself, I found a research that Ralph Allen Dale was uh, fascinated with. I used to, uh, he, was, he called himself the father of uh, reflex science or uh, anatomical alliteration. But if that was true, Donald Lay was the grandfather of atomic, anatomical alliteration or geometric body resonance, doctrine of signatures, things that look alike are alike. If I play a gong, no matter how big it is or how small it is, you'll know it's a gong. If I do a symbol, you'll know it's a symbol. doesn't matter how big, small or whatever. So certain things have resonance. And if you can get one tone to match the other, they will resonate. That's the secret of reflexology. It's resonance. Hmm. So you can actually use your body as a sounding technique to make someone else well by working on over the phone. I've done it before. Wow. So uh, resonance is a very real thing. It transfers for thousands of miles, probably to the moon, though we don't know yet. <laughs> and uh, Carl Jung believed it did. And, uh, and, and anyway... The ear is a shell. If you ever put a shell up to your ear, you hear the sound current. <laughs> and that's exactly what the kidney is. The kidneys are ears. If you have an ear problem, it's often a kidney problem. If you have a kidney problem, it gives you an ear problem. And also uh, the thumb. If you're familiar with polarity therapy, the thumb is sonics or what they call ether or akasha. The next one down is air. The next one down is uh, fire, and then comes water, and then comes earth. Basically, that's particulate matter is matter at the, the pinky finger. The next one, the thyroid, is water or liquid or hydraulics. And then you have fire or metabolism or uh, uh, thermal energy. And then the fourth one, you have uh, air or barometric pressure. That's the secret of bloat. And uh, the third one is calories. But the fourth one is the bloat that is pressurization. And uh, then you have presence or the thumb, which in a martial arts fist, you can go through a wall with your thumb over the four elements. But if you put it under, you're going to break your thumb. <laughs> and meditation is holding your, your hand out straight to uh, clear them. So you have the four elements 
and the presence or the ether. And that's represented in the tarot deck and even the card deck. You have the four suits, which are the four elements, and you have the face cards, or you have the trumps, the major arcana and the smaller arcana. The power is in the mind. And Carl Jung said, the thing is with mind, people think it's trivial, but the mind <laughs> controls us, this movie. But if you tell them it's in your head, they get insulted. But actually, it always is. In, in psychological trauma, you think you're sick, but you're not. But in psychosomatic trauma, it, your mind gives you cancer. Your mind gives you heart disease. Recently on Facebook, I posted that Menninger said that this uh, Stakel had said the most useful uh, neurosis of all is heart problems, cardiac arrest. Wow. It's actually a neurosis. It's caused by being heartless or being heartbroken or being various forms of heart. It's a major thing. And uh, no matter what the, uh, the outcomes of uh, the coronavirus and all that they're claiming now, I won't go into that. Uh, you still are not vulnerable until you have, uh, uh, have a heart emotional uh, problem. And that's a barometric problem, by the way. Wow. Interesting. We well, you have a lot of great material on color recycling and uh we're both wearing red today because it's it's Monday and uh we've had had a show in the past on uh color recycling and wearing basically the rainbow starting at Monday and going through the week, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And I think it's black and then white or something like that. Yep. You so, you actually start with uh black is a trauma, a father trauma. Gray is a mother trauma. Brown is an attachment or a carbon dioxide trauma. <laughs> and then you have red, which is a moving trauma. And red stops you. That's why you have red stoplights. Then you have uh, orange is a sexual trauma. Bunnies will mate under it. Certain uh, uh, goldfish will mate under it. And uh, ducks and bunnies, etc. Then you have yellow, which is a decision trauma. You come up to the traffic light. It turns yellow. Do you hit your brakes or do you go like hell? The yellow is always in the middle of your back being a coward. The, yellows, mm -hmm. the yellow line down your back, the mm -hmm. yellow line in the highway, it always represents uh, indecision and choice. Then you go to green, which is go. That's the traffic light mm -hmm. for go. And that's the heart. The heart should go. But we block it up and clot it up by traumas of having resentment. It's a resentment mm -hmm. trauma. Then you have your blue, which is the depression trauma and uh, even can be an abortion trauma, by the way. And we have the blues. And then you have uh, indigo, which is a trauma with a uh, with authority. But. It's something you have to do. And then you have Violet, which is uh, the authority says, you figure it out. <laughs> I've been like that with a Donald Lay before. He said, you figure it out. Uh oh. <laughs> um, and then you have finally you end up with white, uh, which is a ethics problem and also a resolution completion trauma. All the colors come together as white and uh, in light. And so then you get enlightened by all of the colors being accepted by themselves. And the next one is clear. You get clear of it and you get transparent, that word, transparent. You're beyond the black and the gray now and into transparent. You, you don't go, I want to be colored of my trauma. You go in and say, I want to be clear of my trauma. I don't, I don't want to be... Uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, partially clear of my trauma. <laughs> I don't want to be stuck <laughs> with a particular color. We we'll use the colors for energy then when we get over the trauma. In fact, Monday is an ideal day to do bodybuilding because red builds muscles. <laughs> it stops things and slows it down where you can, uh, you can make particulate matter. 
That's why red is associated with the first chakra, orange with the sexual one, third with the power chakra, green with heart chakra, and blue with the red chakra. Wow. Well, good thing I did a little workout before our show. I definitely <laughs> felt stronger. It's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think wearing the correct colors on different days of the week supports our human potential and physical, mental, and psychic, like our innate abilities? Does it help? Strength yes, out. and uh, we've been going through some trauma the last couple, several months here, actually for about a year or two. Uh, so sometimes I get lax on it. Today I'm wearing red anyway, and uh, and uh, it really helps. I had a friend of mine, a chiropractor named uh, and an acupuncturist and other things named Thaddeus Alien Hedges, <laughs> and he carried color therapy to an extreme and did quite well with it. He would wear the inverse color on the bottom, which is, I don't usually go to that trouble. In other words, red uh, shirt, green pants. He had colored shoes. He had colored hats that matched the, he, he would, uh, he would, he would cause a sensation when he walked around as a, as a uh, red shirt, uh, green pants, uh, orange shirt, blue pants, uh, yellow shirt, violet pants, uh, green shirt, red pants. <laughs> he did the whole thing, and he took a house. He rented a house from another good friend of mine and asked if he could do some work on it. And she's painting. She said, oh, sure, paint it. She didn't know that he would paint the bedroom one color, the kitchen another color, a therapy, and put plastic over it to make the light come in yellow green red and everything well she was freaked out when i told her what he did but i said you know you want to sell the house now but uh someone will enjoy that type of house and sure enough someone paid for it oh, really? <laughs> they liked the idea <laughs> but that he has carried it to the absolute extreme and, and to his credit really good <laughs> wow yeah i know you've talked about painting uh even the the bed sheets and stuff as someone's trying to conceive versus not there's different colors that you use, right? Makes a huge difference. <laughs> but, but after somebody had a, uh, couldn't get pregnant and I told them about the green, they conceived after 10 months, no, after 10 years of not trying to conceive, but they had a miscarriage. And then I realized Maybe people aren't supposed to do this. So then I would question them very carefully. And uh, when people would say, oh, no, we're destined to have this child. I go, oh, my God. But I'd, t I'd tell them, OK, I'm going to tell you the technique, but I'm handing you a loaded gun. I want you to know this. I'm not responsible for anything that happens. But uh, it, it, when I first tried that, because the Donald Lay told me how to do it. And it's in Dinshaw Gadiali's color book, by the way, on how to do it. You'd use uh, green systemically and yellow in the sexual organs. So anyway, I told this person to do green sheets, green beverages and everything. Now, she couldn't get pregnant and her husband hated the color green. He had a trauma. He was an artist and he would not use green. And when he first met her, she she opened the door. He was going to date her her first date. She had a green sweater on. He said, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be a control freak or anything. I can't go out with you if you wear that green sweater. <laughs> so anyway, she asked me. They, they told me they were going to adopt. And I said, uh, I said, I can tell you. I said, do you have all your organs and everything? She said, yes. Well, I can tell you how to get pregnant but your husband isn't going to like it we were all walking together he said he stopped us and said i'll do anything to have a child i says okay wear green use green sheets eat green food think green shit green everything green and she conceived within a month or two and uh the child now is uh, one of my friends on facebook actually <laughs> wow. and the the birth control color is gray is that right Gray is the birth control color, and uh, that's why it's harder to get pregnant at uh, three to five in the morning, which is basically white and gray time and magenta time. And it's easier to get pregnant at bladder time. And science knows that now that you actually have more of a chance of getting pregnant on uh, 
on uh, at three to five in the afternoon. But what they don't know is you have a chance of getting pregnant easier on a Thursday. Now, let me tell you a story about that. A good friend of mine who taught birth control and things like that and was uh, an expert on Lamaze and all kinds of things like that, she got pregnant on a Thursday when I, when I questioned her. And I said, well, I got something to add to your technology on, uh, on birth control. So I told her about that. Now, she had an abortion. Uh, about three years later, I come back and she was pregnant again and had an abortion. And I said, do you know what day you had conceived on? Yeah, Thursday. I said, write this down this time. I'm telling you. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, green works Thursday. Wor I, I can't explain Thursday except by it's very occult and very uh, the way colors work in ways that science doesn't understand. But science does understand the bladder time. You get more oxygenation. Your carbon dioxide time of the day is at lung time, and your and your oxygenation time is at bladder. Oxygenation helps with certain things. Like uh, uh, the oxidation is not bad; it's just how you use it. The right. truth is, when you do the extended yawn, I didn't tell you the whole technique. It's like Kriya. When you take the in breath, you go up your spine, and visualize bringing the you had a cool head. And a ass. That's what you want. Oh, I remember you saying that before. Of, That's all. You, in other words, carbon dioxide you want in your brain, but you don't want it in your colon. That's where it kills people. But you manipulate it up and down your body with visualization, with animal magnetism, with various ways in it, and particularly times of meditation. Lung time is ideally the best time to meditate and before you eat. But as Nada said, don't. Don't use it as an excuse not to meditate because meditation actually it does it does help. It helps develop psychic abilities. Adonis Lay said it's not a good idea to chase the cities and the powers, but if you meditate, you're going to get them. Yeah. So I said, well, I I, I don't want to mess with them because I, I would probably abuse them. And he said, if you meditate. You can't help it. You're going to get them, so you better learn <laughs> learn not to abuse them. <laughs> um, last question, Adam, uh, and this is uh, related to our, our connection issues we've been having with the Internet. <laughs> uh, supposedly Mercury Retrograde started uh, April oh, 2nd. Oh, it did. I think you, it did. Do you I believe in that? that? Supposedly yeah. it goes until the 25th. Do you think that really affects technology? You know, there's <laughs> two ways of looking at it. One, when all the people adopt it, as a possibility, they make it happen. <laughs> because uh, I studied the I Ching, I Ching for years, I even taught workshops on it, even though I'm not a sinologist, I'm not, can't speak Chinese and all that. But uh, I found that a book can change your reality. So whether it's mind or what it is, uh, I take astrology seriously because. Uh, as a synchronicity rather than actually cosmic event. I don't believe that the series, the aster, asteroid is affecting us by any physical level. Now it's well known that Jupiter and uh, Mars and the inner planets of Venus and Mercury do affect us. That's been proved by RCA. So when you have sunspots, you do get effects. You do have more paranormal powers as well as more bad things are supposed to happen and we're probably at a vulnerable time now because we have the devil's comet coming at us comets are always associated with plague and wars and uh, and eclipses are always uh, associated with the same type of things uh, my fifth wife and last one was a uh, astrologer and she was a darn good one she said she wasn't a predictive astrologer, but she said when they claimed that we're going to have an earthquake on the 5th of January, she said, no, what's going to happen is people who have money are going to lose it. And since we don't have any money, we're not going to lose anything. So we don't have to pay attention. But if I was going to get it, I would guess, uh, I think it was the 21st of January, she said. We were staying here in Goleta with a good friend of mine, and the building starts shaking. 
Now, she had picked a day, and this was three hours later at three in the morning. Everybody's panicking while the building's shaking. I'm jumping up and down on the bed saying, she got it, she got it, she got it right. And she's rolling over. Stop waking me up. I want to go back to sleep. (laughs) So she was uh, really good at gaining, uh, uh, guessing rising signs. And she would get annoyed when I would introduce her as someone could do that. Lately, I've been following her blog and I don't know. She's, I think she's lost something off her head. She went back to college and I think they got her. She's into biotech and all that stuff. So I think they got her. (laughs) A lot of people are into human design now, you know, the, what is it? Generator, manifester. I'm a projector, supposedly. Have you heard of that system? I, I've heard of them, yes. And it, these techniques can help, particularly when you align your mind with it, including a, a lot of bodybuilding books admit that the mind is one of the most important things. You have to have focus. You have to uh, you have discipline and a lot of visualization power. They have proved that basketball players can improve their shots by visualizing shooting. If they can't get there, they visualize it. And then you can keep your body uh working by visualizing you're doing exercising too you can actually if you're bedridden you can keep your body from shrinking up by doing visualizations Uh, but i wonder since you were saying co2 is an attachment and you could attach to your body would that be a good time to do visualizations like during a co2 bath yeah i think so i think so it would be because i believe it's kind of a combination of things now donald a went really far with this He said that the universe is, does come from physical matter, does not come from from, uh, vibration. But he pointed up at the stars and said, you see all those stars up there throughout the entire universe? The physical matter would fit in a symbol, and everything else is acceleration. That gives us what we call mind over mind, or the sixth chakra, the manifest master, when you Come back into the matrix like Neo and you play around and do things and have fun. <laughs> so he called the ascending master, as Carl Jung did, useless. What's it good to be ascending? You're not doing anything. Because Adonis did believe the fun in this, in the drama, in the movies. That's why we go to the movies, watch movies. We watch all these uh, Star Trek movies and, uh, and uh, television shows and stuff like that because we like movies. So nothing wrong with that as long as you realize it's a movie and dracula can't jump off the stage and bite you back. <laughs> that's that's funny yeah i definitely overdid it last year with movies i probably watched i don't know over 200 and to me that's way too much i i feel best if i watch like one or two movies a year and all the new ones are just horrible um and it's they it's hard to are. go back and find good ones <laughs> <laughs> I've watched uh, there's I used to watch six movies in the night at the movie theaters. Wow. <laughs> yeah, he's got to they they closed it down. I had to go to end up at the drive in. Friday was my movie. It would go on for about a month and a half, then I run out of movies. So, so I had to stop <laughs> because I'd seen everything. <laughs> I mean everything. <laughs> well uh uh solartiming.com and then stunsync nutrition and I noticed on the the mini ebooks you have so far this year, solar timing related quotes. Is that your newest? Yeah, yeah I'm using a, a lot of those. And uh, and uh, probably the solar timing is uh, one of our best sellers. The best sellers now are mind hacking because I really cool. wish to get people to do that. They, they have no idea how potent it is. You're in a bad place to learn this, by the way, because even when you were living there with somebody, uh, turning one person's feet, you're not going to learn it. You have to be a party animal or at least a social person where you go to a great get in and you say, you get someone down and start turning their feet. And then everybody says, what are you doing? Then you explain it. Oh, can I, can you do me too? And pretty soon you get all the volunteers. Well, a lot of people, It. I had a friend called Carol Crosby. It, it took me 20 minutes to find her traumas. Uh, until her mother went on cosmic vacation. Then it took me two minutes to find it. So you have to find traumatized people. And some people aren't even in their bodies. So you'll find they're very, very tight and other people are loose. So you have to compare and do about 
20 people. But once you see that it's just yes, no, and you can find out who's traumatizing you and that most of us have often have no idea who traumatizes us. Sometimes we do, but sometimes we pick the wrong parent or the wrong spouse or whatever, and it's something unrelated, we think. So yeah, solartiming.com, definitely check out Adam's eBooks and then uh, sunsinknutrition.com if you guys want to see. I pay right. for the lifetime membership and you can see the timing of everything. And uh, Yep, I, we have a lot of people signed up and we, we actually work with, uh, do, you, do you know Guru? I think, I think you yeah, know Yeah, we're friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've been yeah. speaking with him. I, t- I think I talked to him like once a year, but it's, it's always great. <laughs> He's an interesting guy. We've we've only uh, recently we co- contacted him. He was traveling again. He travels a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, yeah, yeah, good guy. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I love my friends that uh, I can talk to him very infrequently, and it's like, uh, you know, versus the ones that just keep reaching out constantly, versus the ones that it's infrequent, but it's like no time passed. You know. I, it's, uh, yep. that's my favorite connections. <laughs> I, I know that, uh, sometimes yeah. I haven't seen, I haven't seen my co-author of Yes, No, Maybe for about several years now, you know, we, we well, email once in a while, but yeah. that's about it. So, yeah. Yeah, but I think of them fondly. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, awesome, Adam. Well, thanks so much for, uh, coming on the show as always, and we'll do it again uh, in a few weeks here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. And we, we'll talk about because we didn't cover the list here. I've got oh, uh, more yeah. abilities because they can be. And because it, the synchronicity was someone asked me to do, uh, do I have a book on bodybuilding or what I consider doing it? And I thought, God, there's so much there. How could I do it? Then I decided I'm going to do a journal, probably called something like Muscle and Vital Force or Life Force journal uh because i have so much scattered information i can put what exercises work best for results uh the mind body connection what is chi what is prana what is elan vital what are all these things and how do they work to gain uh uh, muscles and and i've had a lot of uh i've had a lot of bodybuilding friends in the past that taught me a lot and uh and they have been obsessed with it. So I figure, how come I've never done anything like that except mentioned it tangentially here and there? And well, particularly sounds- the supernatural powers of people who can do things like the mighty Adam and uh, the, the Scottish Apollo. Those people had powers that that are just almost unbelievable that they could do and that they mastered. So that is, wow. again, anthro po maximology. <laughs> Sounds like our next show, and it's it's actually good timing because I just got back into strength training, and uh, I don't overdo it because I'm into longevity, and I've tore up my back from deadlifting in the past. So I think I think it's perfect timing because then I'll be into it for a while, and I'll have a lot to say on it, and it should be a fun show. So all right, let's, let's yeah, make that we can compare one. our notes for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like the resistance band, so we'll talk about that. But yeah, you bet. <laughs> yeah. You bet. <laughs> awesome, madam. We'll stick around as we close out the show. Okay. (laughs) That is all for today's show. Hopefully the quality wasn't that bad. Adam kept cutting in and out and losing connection and power several times. So we actually had to record two different weeks for this show, but I think it turned out great. He's always a blast to talk to. One of my favorite parts was when he was talking about the sleep timing. There was a time last year and even earlier this year where I was waking up in the middle of the night every single night at around 3 p.m. And it's really interesting that Adam said the ideal time to sleep is between 10 p.m. and 3 a.m. And to study, if you want to become a genius or meditate to be enlightened, I thought I was dealing with a health problem. And maybe it was stress because I've had substantial amount of stress. I think we all have. But I could say for me, especially, definitely been chronically stressed. And I was wondering if it was the vitamin C supplementation and potential oxalate problems or if it was melatonin that I was supplementing also disrupting my circadian rhythm from my experience with waking up in the middle of the night, 
it is really related to stress. And I find if I go to bed earlier and not after like 11 p.m., then I usually sleep through the night, no problem. But if I go to bed later, even really after 1030, I find that I don't sleep as well and I usually have interrupted sleep. I've actually interviewed Adam about sleep before. So if you search Adam Bergstrom sleep on YouTube, it should come up and he has some interesting things to say about it. His two websites are sunsinknutrition.com. We've had some shows on solar nutrition or solar eating, which is the idea of eating different foods at specific times of day. So that website, Sunsink Nutrition, is great. If you want to dive into that and experiment with it, you can pay for a membership and you could see a food list of what to eat at what times. His other website is solartiming.com. That's where he has all of his eBooks. My favorite books from him are the ones that he wrote on yellow fat disease. He actually has something called a compendium with more than 325 pages of all of his research on what is also called degenerative lipofuscinosis or lipofuscin, like you've heard me talk about. I agree with Adam that it's one of the biggest issues that humanity faces and nobody is really talking about it. I notice, especially with a lot of keto coaches and also quantum health influencers that you'll start to see these spots, especially on their forehead and it's called age spots and Adam calls them omega-3 barcodes, but there's all of these things that play into it potentially excess iron or misplaced iron. There could be excess estrogen involved, excess metals in general, like aluminum, but sunlight supercharges it. And so if you already have these in your skin and you go out in the sun, they just spread like a wildfire. So things like vitamin E are really important to emphasize. And whenever I hear people talk about fat soluble vitamins, like big health influencers in this space, they'll often skip right over E. They'll say A, D, and K. And I said, wait, there's another one you missed, and it's probably the most important one, which is vitamin E. And credit to Adam Bergstrom for introducing me to vitamin E, and then I got into Ray Pete's work because of Adam Bergstrom and read Ray Pete's work on vitamin E and listened to all of his interviews on it. And I was inspired to start taking it. And this is after being an algae oil salesman and realizing that that product was not good for human health, especially taken chronically, especially in high doses. So I started personally experimenting with vitamin E, fairly high dose for about a year or so. And it totally changed my life and I think reversed my age. So if you want to check that out and other products, my brand is MitoLife. You can find that at mitolife.co. We have an undercounter drinking water filter that is beyond reverse osmosis. If you look on the water tab, you'll see a shower filter there, but it says coming soon. So we're working on a really nice, really simple shower filter. We're not really reinventing the wheel, but we're making a point that you need to have enough filtration media, like enough volume to make a difference. Because if you go to Home Depot and I've done it and you buy their little $30 filter or Amazon or eBay or even your health food store, it's just a tiny little filter and the water is running through it so fast. There's not enough contact time with the filtration media to remove problems in the water. So we're using KDF 55, which is a really broad acting filtration media. The target is chlorine. So KDF 55 reduces chlorine by over 99%, but it also touches metals, heavy metals like lead and arsenic. And it'll even take out some iron if you have excess iron in your water. So stay tuned for that. That should be in stock very soon. And then under the wellness category, we have a whole bunch of different supplements. 
And I often get asked by people, if you could just take one, what would it be? It would definitely be Shilajit. So I take one gram of my Panacea product every day. And that's the main supplement that changed my life. It's like the red pill in the matrix. It's a source of all minerals, macro minerals, trace minerals, ultra trace minerals, and it's combined with humic and fulvic acid. So it actually delivers it into your cells. So a lot of people are either doing those mineral salt packs, like the stand up little sticks that you dump in water and stir them up for their potassium, magnesium, and sodium. This is way beyond those. And this is also way better than those little resin jars that you can buy with a little spoon inside. It's just such a pain if you've taken other Shilajit products. So ours are actually compressed tablets and it's not messy as long as you keep them out of your hot car or out of your hot environment. Some people like to keep them in the fridge and I just pop five of them in, swallow them with my morning coffee and I feel really great taking it. Sometimes I'll take a second or third dose later in the day. By the way, if you're on Instagram, check out the MitoLife page. So it's just at MitoLife. There's so many questions that we get flooded with. And I put a lot of time and energy and resources into education about all of these products and how and when and why to use them. So we recently did a post on timing of the MitoLife supplements, and that can be found on the MitoLife Instagram. And I think the MitoLife Facebook as well, but I think the Instagram is the best source for that. My website is matt-blackburn.com. You can read about my CLF protocol, which stands for calcification, lipofuscin, and fibrosis. I talk about why they're a problem and my solutions to them which circles back to the MitoLife products. So dissolve it all or systemic enzymes for fibrosis or really any fibrotic condition. Vitamin E is a big one for lipofuscin, but there's also lifestyle practices to do. I would say don't overdo sun exposure and get a really high quality red light, LED light specifically like from the company Gemba Red, and red light is helpful for lipofuscin. And then calcification, which is probably the most misunderstood of the three. Lipofuscin's just not known, but calcification's well known. It's thrown around there, calcified pineal gland. But a lot of people don't understand that too little or too much vitamin D can both cause calcification. And a lot of people are familiar with K2, but they're less familiar with magnesium that regulates that whole process as well. And also how powerful Shilajit is for calcification. But I think that one, you really need a truckload over time. So that is taking Shilajit consistently for years instead of just cycling on and off it and not really taking your Shilajit dosing seriously. So on my Matt-Blackburn website, I have the CLF protocol. I also have all of my recommended products. And on the front page, I just added the Zeolite from Zeolite Labs. I just interviewed Jeff Hoyt. If you want to go back and listen to that about this really powerful substance called Zeolite, something else that's misunderstood. So he talks a lot about the myths of liquid zeolite, nano zeolite, and why he sells just a straight powder and why you want to megadose it. And actually taking too small of a dose can cause a more intense detox, which is counterintuitive. So if you're not following me on social media, or if you can't see my stuff because I'm severely shadow banned, I can't even go live anymore on my page, then I'll tell you the experiment here that I've been doing because I've had several shows on hair tissue mineral analysis and analyzing my two lab tests. I recently had a show with Matt Kaufman and there was a too big of a gap between the tests, but at least I had a recent one from the last few months to look at with him. 
and I'm pretty much dumping all metals. And I've done a lot of crazy experiments over the years. I mean, several years in a row of sleeping on 20 gauss, really strong permanent magnets, like the Magnetico sleep pad. That's a really powerful heavy metal chelator pushing metals around. But I really didn't pay attention to the whole binding aspect of it. So instead of going the mineral balancing approach, which, yeah, I'm supplementing zinc and a little bit of copper, even though I'm releasing copper, go back and listen to the show if you want to wrap your head around that one. My current experiment is just the zeolite from Zeolite Labs. I'm doing like six scoops once a day and high dose melatonin from MitoLife. So I'm personally taking it. I don't recommend this. For you, you know, you have to chat with your doctor and decide what dosage is right for you. I'm taking 200 milligrams of oral melatonin every night, which is a powerful heavy metal chelator. That's proven in the literature that melatonin does that with the zeolite. And I'm sure I'm doing other things that are also pushing metals around. I mean, even just the fulvic and humic and shilogy has that effect. So that is my experiment, and I'll be retesting my hair. So sending in some hair clippings, they burn it, they see the spectral emission from the hair and then see my mineral ratios. And I will be public if that experiment worked or not to see if my metals actually went down from doing melatonin with zeolite every day. Last thing, check out the MitoLife Academy that's on YouTube. It's $15 a month. You get two private videos every month, latest research, experiments. Did one last month on tequila for lipofuscin specifically. And then the last day of every month, I do a live Q&A where you can ask me anything there on YouTube. And I actually just posted a giveaway. So occasionally, usually like once a quarter, I'll give away a device or supplements to members of the Academy. So that is all. I'll see you guys next Friday. Stay supercharged. Thank you.